Hello and welcome to AJ Bell Luminary. I'm Danny Hewson, Head of Financial Analysis at AJ Bell, and I'm delighted to be your host for this webinar version of our highly successful event. AJ Bell introduced Luminary to the event schedule when research highlighted regular feedback from delegates requesting us to feature more female speakers on our seminar lineups. We're also mindful female delegates made up less than 20% of our audience, therefore wanted to produce an event that was a little different than our typical roadshow sessions. This session features some insightful speakers, and we'd be delighted for you to share your experience with as many people as possible. Once you've watched the whole webinar, please fill in the feedback form that will pop up at the end, and we'll send you your CPD certificate, a copy of the slides, and a link to the recording. And of course, please feel free to share that. If you have any questions for our speakers, do pop them over to us using the chat function and we'll deal with them after the webinar. Now it is time to sit back and I will introduce our first speaker, Laura Souter. Laura is our Head of Personal Finance. She joined just over five years ago from the Daily Telegraph where she was investment editor. Laura's focus today is on the Lifetime ISA, which has been around for six years now. She'll be looking at the product's popularity and funding levels, as well as highlighting some key points to make sure your clients aren't missing out on those all important allowances. Please welcome Laura Souter. <laughs> Hi there, so today I'm going to talk about the Lifetime ISA. We are now six years, more than six years into the launch of the Lifetime ISA, so I thought it would be a good time to recap what we can use it for, how well Take Up has gone since it was launched six years ago, and then some of the quirks or the technical issues that you need to be aware of if you're using the Lifetime ISA that have kind of emerged over the past few years. So today I'm going to do a run through of what the Lifetime ISA is. Some people might be really familiar with it, other people might not have used it that much. So I'm just going to do a run through of the basics so we're all on the same page. Um, then I'm going to talk about how much uptake we've seen, so how much people are actually using the Lifetime ISA. Then some of the pitfalls that we've noticed um, that are good to be aware of if you're using it with clients. And then some of our lobbying work. Um, that relates to the Lifetime ISA, but also a bit broader. So first up, let's go through the basics of the Lifetime ISA. It's quite often called the Frankenstein's ISA because it has two very different purposes. One is for saving for a first home, so that would generally be younger people. The other is saving for retirement, so an alternative to a pension, um, and that could obviously span a whole age range of people. Um, so quite different purposes, quite different uses of it at different points in life. Um, but you can open an account if you're between the age of 18 and 40. Once you've hit your 40th birthday, you're not eligible to open the Lifetime ISA. Um, that's partly why lots of people um, recommend opening a Lifetime ISA just before your 40th birthday. Even if you're not sure that you'll need it, you can open it and put a small amount of money in it. And then at least the account is open and for you to be able to use it in the future. So that's one tip that's worth bearing in mind. Um, you can pay up to £4,000 a year into the Lifetime ISA. That counts as part of your overall £20,000 um, ISA annual contribution limit per person. Um, but you get free money on top of that. So in a similar way to pension tax relief works on pensions, you get a government bonus of 25% each year. So that would be a maximum of £1,000 if you contributed the full £4,000 in one year. Obviously, if you contribute lower amounts, you get a smaller government bonus, but at that 25%. But there is quite a lot of detail to the Lifetime ISA, and it can be quite a complicated product, particularly because it's got those dual purposes to it. So it can only be used for a first home in the UK. Um, and so if you'd inherited a property previously, you wouldn't be able to use the Lifetime ISA for that first home. Um, if you're using it for the first home purpose, it, it's got to be for a home that you plan on living in. It can't be for a buy to let. What we're seeing quite often now is um, younger people are priced out of buying in the 
area that they live and work in, so in more expensive cities or London, for example. Um, and so instead, their first rung on the ladder is buying a property, maybe back where they grew up, um, that they then plan to rent out as a way of getting on the property ladder, but not in the pricey area they live in. Um, if that was going to be the route you're going to take, you wouldn't be able to use the lifetime ISA for that. It has to be for a property that you're planning to live in. There are some exceptions further down the line if you wanted to rent out a room or if you had to move away for work, but initially it has to be with the intention of, of occupying the property. Um, you have to have had lifetime open, lifetime ISA open and funded for 12 months before you can use it for the deposit. Um, and funded is the crucial part here. So it's 12 months from when you make the first contribution into the lifetime ISA um, before you can use it to buy a first property. So it's not an option for anyone who plans to buy in the next year if they haven't already opened and funded that account. And there's a limit, so you can only buy a property worth up to £450,000. Um, for lots of people, that's an ample limit. For people buying in more expensive areas, in cities, London and the southeast, um, they might start to come up against that limit. And it's the same limit if you're buying with someone else. So the great thing about a lifetime ISA is if you're buying with someone else, you can each have a lifetime ISA and be each benefit from that £1,000 a year government bonus. Um, but that £450,000 limit is an overall limit. You don't get it doubled if you're buying with someone else. Um, it's also the case that it applies to the total value of a shared ownership property. So some people buying shared ownership would be buying a, will be buying a small chunk of it, um, well under that £450,000 limit, but that limit is applied to the overall 100% value of that shared ownership property. So that's something to look out for as well. Uh, you only get the government bonus up until the age of 50 and then if you're using it for a pension alternative you can access the money penalty free at the age of 60 and crucially that's also where it differs from pensions is that you can access the money entirely tax-free so there's no tax-free lump sum like there is with pensions you could withdraw the entire pot once you hit the age of 60 and you wouldn't pay any tax on that money you also get the same tax benefits um, as while you have the account and while your money is growing as a normal ISA so um, no dividend tax and no capital gains tax due on the money in the account but then the big drawback of a lifetime ISA is the exit penalty so there's an exit penalty of 25% that you'll pay on any money you withdraw that's not for that first home purpose or once you've reached 60. Um, there are a few exceptions if you've got a terminal illness for example or if you die but they're very niche exceptions. Um, initially people think that that 25% exit fee is just the government taking back their bonus but actually it's not it works as an effective charge on your money a 6.25 percent charge for example um, and so that means that you'll get back less than you actually contributed um, under normal circumstances so it's really one to be aware of and, and it's not kind of an easy access dip in dip out account but it can be so effective and really kind of unbeatable for those people saving for their first deposit if they meet all of the criteria for it. So I've looked at an example here of someone saving £3,000 a year over 10 years and that being their kind of deposit saving journey. Um, obviously you could save more, you can save £4,000 a year into the account but um, for some people if they're starting out in work that might not be an attainable sum at that point so I went with a, a lower figure. So if we look at the first um, section of the graph this is saving for that money without uh, the lifetime ISA so you're contributing £30,000 over that 10-year period um, and then you get just over £9,500 worth of investment growth on it and I've assumed 5% growth a year um, on that and so you get to a deposit pot size of just under £40,000. However, if you use the lifetime ISA, you are contributing that same £30,000, so the same cost to the individual. However, you're also getting £7,500 of lifetime ISA contributions from the government um, into that money. And that then turns into a higher investment growth because you get that um, government bonus paid in almost immediately. And so you're benefiting from investment growth each year on that government bonus. And then the beauty of compounding means that that really accelerates your return. So not only do you benefit from the free government money, but also the effect of compounding um, over the years 
on the investment growth on that money. And so then that takes you to um, almost £50,000, £49,500 um, after 10 years. And so you can see that it really accelerates your pot size. And what that means for that individual is they then have a larger deposit size so they can um, uh, get a better mortgage rate potentially if they've got a better loan to value or they can buy a more expensive property or they can shave years off their um, deposit saving journey by being able to buy sooner than that 10 year window that I've set out there. So it's really effective for um, those people saving for their first home. But I thought it would be interesting now, we're kind of six years in, to look at take up of the product. So these are government figures that are published on the use of lifetime ISA accounts. Um, frustratingly, they are quite out of date. The government's quite slow to publish these figures. So the latest data that we have for this is the 2020 21 tax year um, so a couple of years out of date now but what we can see here is the trend over time is that um, use has increased every year and there's actually really decent take up of the accounts when they were first launched there was quite a short period between the government announcing them and their launch date and it meant that um, quite a few providers weren't ready at launch and so it was kind of a slower rollout initially and obviously as more providers came to market that meant that more marketing and advertising was done of the products people were more aware that they could use them and they became much more mainstream um, so in the red there we can see the number of accounts um, is uh, over half a million um, and then we can see the amounts subscribed in millions there um, and then we can see the impact of the government boost on the money. So this is the money paid in by individuals in red, and then in black, we've got the government bonus added on top and the impact that that has. Um, and you can see that that's you know, a really chunky benefit to those savers. But on the downside, we have the exit penalty. And so this is the total amount charged in withdrawal charges, so that 25% exit charge that I talked about earlier. Um, what we saw during the pandemic is that the government actually reduced that 25% down to 20% to reflect the fact that people might have seen a knock to their income and that they might want to take that money out um, because they've been furloughed or lost their job, for example. And so the government took away the kind of penalty aspect of the exit charge, took it back down to that 20%, which was just redeeming the government bonus. Um, However, that was a temporary change and they've now put it back up to 25%. So that would have kind of impacted those withdrawal charge figures. Um, but we can still see a huge amount of money is being lost um, in withdrawal charges. And I think in lots of cases that would be people not being aware that they're being penalised for um, taking that money out. And I think there's a few things that are going to impact the uptake of the lifetime ISA in the coming years. I don't think these will be dramatic changes to those take up numbers. I think we'll continue to see a growing trend upwards um, as many people see the kind of big benefits of the accounts. But there are a few things kind of on the margin that will affect it. More people will hit that property limit or will be worried about doing so in the future. So if you're starting saving for a deposit today and you think that it might be five or ten years before you uh, can afford a home, you might be worried about hitting that £450,000 limit, particularly having seen how much house price growth has, has gone over the years. Um, the government hasn't increased that £450,000 property limit since it launched the account six years ago and so people might quite rightly think that they don't have confidence that that limit is going to be raised with rising house prices so that might put them off using it. Um, and then for people using it as a pension alternative, the recent changes to the lifetime allowance and the annual allowance on pensions might impact um, the kind of popularity of lifetime ISAs. So some people who have hit their either annual allowance or lifetime allowance would then turn to using a lifetime ISA as an alternative um, where they get that government bonus similar to tax relief and they can put away a little bit of extra money. Obviously the annual allowance is now higher so there will be a smaller number of people that will be hitting that new £60,000 a year limit. The same for the money purchase annual allowance that's gone from £4,000 up to £10,000 so there might be fewer people using the lifetime ISA as an alternative to that. And the same with the lifetime, ISA, lifetime allowance, sorry, that's been removed altogether. And so those people that previously were using the lifetime ISA 
to top up their retirement savings because they'd hit the lifetime allowance um, now wouldn't wouldn't need to use the lifetime ISA. Like I say, I think those will be kind of at the margins. They'll be uh, they didn't make up the bulk of people using lifetime ISAs, but there's kind of a few more technical areas where people might not want to use them as much. And then I thought it would be useful to run through the pitfalls, so the things that people need to be aware of um, when they're using the lifetime ISA. The first is something that the government has recently warned about, and that's ensuring that the details that you give your lifetime ISA provider match the details that you've got with HMRC. And so how this works is you, as an individual, you apply to a lifetime ISA provider to open an account, you pay your money in, and then at that point, the lifetime ISA provider goes to the government to claim the government bonus on your behalf. If your details that you've given um, the ISA provider don't exactly match what you've got on your HMRC account, so your kind of government gateway account, um, then the government will reject that request for a bonus. And ultimately, if it can't be resolved, the ISA provider is bound to close that ISA account, that lifetime ISA account for you. There is um, ability to have a bit of back and forth to try and work out what the discrepancy is. Quite often it's things like people still having their maiden name on their HMRC account and giving their married name to the ISA provider. Or it might be things like people not using a middle name with their lifetime ISA provider, but that being on their HMRC account. Or just simple errors in one or the other in terms of with national insurance number or date of birth. So it's something to definitely encourage clients to check their HMRC account details are up to date to avoid having to go through that kind of back and forth detective work of working out what the difference is between the accounts. Um, there's that one year rule for house purchase that I talked about earlier. So that's definitely something to bear in mind for people who think that they might be buying a property before um, that one year window. Um, there's also another quirk of how the accounts are designed by the government that you need to deposit money in the same tax year that you opened the lifetime ISA for it to be a valid opening. So just opening the account isn't enough, you need to put money in. In normal times this is fine, but if you're rushing at the end of a tax year to open the account and fund it and you don't quite fund it in time before the new tax year hits, um, then you'd fall foul of this rule. And um, frustratingly, um, ISA providers are forced to then close the account and you have to reopen it in that new tax year and fund it in the same year. So it's something to definitely be aware of. And there isn't a minimum limit. You could just put you know, 50 pounds, 10 pounds in that account um, so that it's counted as funded and open to avoid the admin headache of that account being closed and having to go back through the application process. Um, you also can't pay into a cash lifetime ISA and a stocks and shares lifetime ISA in the same tax year. So there are the two versions that are offered by different providers, um, but you can't pay into one of each kind in the same tax year, which is a bit confusing because it often differs from main ISA rules where you can pay into a cash ISA and a stocks and shares ISA in the same tax year. For lifetime ISA purposes, they are counted as the same type of ISA. They all come under the lifetime ISA umbrella. So you can only pay into one or the other. So when dealing with clients, it's important to check that they haven't already made a payment into another lifetime ISA um, this year. Um, you can transfer in money from other ISAs, but it will count towards that £4,000 limit. And there, the predecessor to the lifetime ISA for the house purchase point of view was the help to buy ISA. And so lots of people might want to transfer their help to buy ISA into their lifetime ISA. But if they had more than £4,000 in it, then they might need to do, well, they will need to do that over a number of tax years. So from a financial planning point of view, it's worth bearing that in mind and seeing how many years they would need to transfer that money over. Um, help to buy ISAs are now closed to, to new customers, but lots of people still have them um, sitting there. So it's important to kind of weigh up the time frame of doing that transfer versus the um, benefits of, of moving to a lifetime ISA. And then the final thing is you could wait up to eight weeks for your bonus money, so the government bonus money to be paid into the account. This is very much a worst case scenario, but there is a time lag between you paying in money into the lifetime ISA account, 
your ISA provider going to the government and claiming that bonus and then that bonus being paid and there's kind of a schedule that that happens. Normally that's not an issue but if you're looking to make that last final lifetime ISA contribution before you purchase the home in order to get that extra bit of government bonus um, you just need to be aware of the timescales there and whether the government bonus would have come in before you need to use that money as a deposit. So if you're trying to make that final contribution before you were going to use the account to purchase your first home, you just need to be aware of the timings of that. And the best um, thing to do is to call up your ISA provider and just find out what their timescales for this are and, and give them the scenario if, you've, if you paid money in on this certain date, when will the government bonus money clear and they'll be able to help you with it. And just finally, I thought I'd talk a bit about our lobbying work that we're doing relating to the Lifetime ISA, but also more broadly. Um, so we have a whole team of people who work on uh, dealing with the government, with regulators, with different trade organisations to lobby for various different things within the savings and investment landscape. Um, and a few of the things that we're doing that relate to ISAs are um, calling for the property limit to be increased on the lifetime ISA. Uh, so property prices have risen dramatically in the past six years. Um, the average property price was £208,000 when the lifetime ISA was launched. It's now £290,000. And um, we calculated that if that £450,000 property limit had increased with um, house price inflation, it would now be sitting closer to £600,000. So it would be a huge increase and it's something that's going to prevent a lifetime ISA uptake in the future if it isn't um, raised to match uh, rising property prices. Um, the next, next aspect is to cut the exit charge. So we think that that exit penalty should be taken from 25% down to 20% like it was during the pandemic and um, what we saw in the most recent year that we've got data for is 33 million was taken in that withdrawal charge um, and we think that people should be given more access to that money. Most people are using this as long-term savings but if they need to dip into that money during the current cost of living crisis for example they should be able to access it without the government um, taking a penalty. And then more broadly, we have um, the one ISA proposal, which is to cut a lot of the confusion in the ISA regime and simplify the system. And what we think is if the ISA regime is much simpler, then more people will engage with it, more people will save their money and um, will invest their money and they will benefit from, from the financial wealth that that gives them over time. There's more details on this and you can certainly um, request that from us and we can send you the full paper and all of the details. It involves streamlining everything into one ISA, involves um, scrapping the innovative finance ISA, for example, and kind of changing how the bonus would work on the lifetime ISA and meaning that the government could use it to incentivize savings for other areas in life as well. So if you want to get more information on that, then definitely do request that and we can send it over. Thanks very much for your time. I hope that was useful. Um, if you have any questions, and do, of course, send them in and um, we will try to get back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Next up, an incredible speaker, the wonderful Helena Morrissey, founder of the Diversity Project, the 30% Club, and founding ambassador of AJ Bell's own Money Matters campaign which aims to get more women comfortable talking about their finances and hopefully narrowing that gender investment gap. In this frank talk, Baroness Morrissey will discuss her years in financial services, why she felt compelled to take action to promote diversity and the impact that those initiatives are having. Please welcome Helena Morrissey. <laughs> Hello, and I'm glad to be with you, even if we're not together in person. I hope that you're enjoying these uh, recordings and that one day we'll get to meet in real life. Now, like me, you work in a sector where women are quite significantly underrepresented. In fact, I think fund management, where I spent most of my career, just beats financial advice in terms of the dubious honor of the bottom spot. Uh, even today, only 12% of named fund managers are women. And just to give you a flavor of what that can result in, um, at the peak of my own career managing money in the noughties, 
um, my competition weren't just all men, but they were all men called Paul. Uh, there were five Pauls, this is absolute truth, um, and of course that led to some rather amusing situations where we'd be on an investment panel at a conference together, Paul, 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 and hello there. And sometimes I won awards, and to this day, I'm never quite sure if it was because I was the only one that the judges could pick out from the lineup parade. So there were some advantages, but in my 35 years in the city, I'm afraid I, along with a lot of women, have certainly experienced my share of setbacks, discrimination, misogyny. Um, but actually, despite all of that, up until quite recently, I've been pretty optimistic that we're making good uh, progress when it comes to gender equality. And in 2018, just to put my money where my mouth is, um, I actually published a book uh, called A Good Time to Be a Girl. Now, you might feel doubtful about that, but I would argue that on most criteria, whether you're looking at um, women on boards, uh, women in parliament, female prime ministers, women being appointed to new big roles for the first time, then in the developed world, at least, we were making fast progress after many years of little change. Of course, there were some disappointments as well. Um, still today, only 4% or 12 of the CEOs across the FTSE 350 are women. And of course, we still have a gender pay gap, although now it's less than 10% for full-time workers. But I have genuinely, genuinely in my career witnessed considerable progress, particularly when it comes to culture and behaviours, which is one of the reasons why I've been so incensed recently about developments at the CBI. Really, I mean, when I started working, um, everyday sexism, as they say, and banter across the desk, even taking clients to lap dancing clubs, well, that was just commonplace. When I had my first child, aged 25, I came back to work after not a particularly long maternity leave, um, and I was eligible for the first promotion, and I didn't get it. And when I asked my boss what I needed to do differently, um, what areas of my performance did I need to work on to get it next time, he said, oh, Helena, don't worry about your performance, that's just great, but there is some doubt over your commitment to the baby. And of course, no one would say that today. I think we've also seen a growing awareness that progress when it comes to gender equality isn't just about having a few more white, affluent, privileged, well-educated, middle-aged women like me, um, in top jobs, but it's actually about trying to ensure that many women with diverse backgrounds and characteristics um, have more choice, that there are obviously many more ways than the one single path to achieve um, a happy, successful life and career, and that true progress uh, requires um, enabling many more women to fulfil their potential. There's also um, the growing opportunity for us to succeed as women, which I think is another cause for celebration. When I started out, I was the only woman in a team of 16. Um, perhaps I should have foreseen that promotion setback. Um, but I used to try to blend in. I hated being different. Um, I would wear horrible, shapeless, pinstripe trouser suits, not the glamorous sort you can get these days, but much more sort of frumpy, shapeless copies of men's suits um, in a forlorn effort to blend in. Um, those few women, I looked around me and I realized those few women at the time who had succeeded had done so by adopting, adopting the trappings of male power. They were extra tough, extra assertive, and frankly, I was terrified of them. Power at that point was top-down, macho, command and control. But then things changed quite dramatically, and really the catalyst for change was the financial crisis, because uh, suddenly it became obvious that this was not a good way. Um, having one type of person run everything uh, couldn't possibly be the optimal team. At the time of his ill-fated acquisition of ABN AMRO, the Royal Bank of Scotland board comprised 18 people, 17 men. Most of them seemed to have grown up in the same street in Edinburgh. And the regulators cited groupthink as one of the causal factors behind the acquisition and their ultimate failure. Now, groupthink sounds like, oh, it's just a cozy club, people agreeing with each other, but it's much more pernicious. It's where the group sort of closes in on itself. It shuts out dissenting voices. It believes it's not only right, but good as well, and it's a very dangerous situation. Now, as banks scrambled to recover, of course, suddenly difference was very welcome, and this was the genesis of the 30% Club, which I established um, in 2010. Um, of course, it wasn't the first thing on our minds, so we must have more diversity on boards, but clearly there was an appetite for change that you just don't see when you have calm, stable environments. 
And as Albert Einstein put it, you can't solve a problem by using the same kind of thinking as you did when you created it. So suddenly there was a receptivity to change. Um, there have been lots of initiatives before to try to get more balance in the boardroom, um, but the timing was right this time. The other thing was um, that we had a, a slightly different formula than before. Critically, we sought out allies. And I learned through this experience that if you're going to make progress when it comes to diversity and inclusion, you really need those who are already in power, willing and, and able to share that power. So the members of the 30% Club are, were uh, the chairman, and most of them, 99 out of the FTSE chairs at the time we launched, were men. Now, I have to emphasize that not everybody was completely on board with this idea. I think one of the things about change is like Schopenhauer's um, observation that when you come up with something, a new idea, then often it's ridiculed before third stage, everyone accepts it and assumes it was always like that. When the 30% Club was in its early days, um, I will remember very well, um, some people were very antagonistic. I remember one FTSE chair, actually he was chair of two FTSE companies, yelling at me that I was going to destroy British business. Not that I had that in my power. Um, but of course, gradually, what was very exciting to see was that those people, first of all, went quite quiet and they realized that they were on the wrong side of history. So some of them became absolutely generous, full-time, supporters, you know, absolutely passionate about it. Um, and incredibly, really, we went from less than 10% female representation across the, the top 350 listed companies to 40% today, which frankly amazes even me. Um, and it shows me that bigger change, I mean, this is women in the boardroom, it's exciting, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, it shows me that bigger, broader change is possible. So overall, leading up to the publication of A Good Time to Be a Girl, I would argue that we were making good progress. And then, of course, the pandemic struck. Um, and as has been well documented, uh, women, I mean, it was tough on everybody, but women tended to bear the brunt uh, disproportionately. You will have your own stories to tell, um, but uh, my household at the time of the first lockdown, my kind of lockdown gan, number 13 people. Um, I have nine children, um, and to cut a long story short, my grandchildren at the time, very tiny, came to live with us. Lovely, I adore my grandchildren, so it was a wonderful time with them. And of course, we always remember the lovely weather if we had a garden, that was a very big bonus, but the logistics uh, were challenging. And of course, um, you know, we all, as I say, have our own stories to tell, but my day would comprise of Zoom meetings, rushing down to load a giant load of washing, in the washing machine, unload it, of course, as well, put the drying on. I don't know why I bothered putting a heap of laundry on the ironing board because it never got ironed. And my poor husband was doing all the cooking and catering, and of course, that was a huge challenge. Now, I'm not going to claim this was um, as exhausting as obviously some people's challenge, but our days got longer and longer, and we really tried to, you know, do all the tasks um, in a household as well as in our daily lives at work. And women's careers tended to suffer. Um, I have quite a few colleagues and friends who had to give up work completely, if they were single mothers, however understanding their bosses were, it just was impractical. McKinsey's estimates that COVID set women's careers back by at least five years. And it also reminded us that we are never going to get equality at work until we have more something like equality at home. Now, of course, we're not in COVID anymore, but after that giant shock, we were never going to pick up where we left off. Uh, Post-pandemic, we have new ways of working, um, but we also have challenges like strikes, the cost of living crisis. And as you know, um, you don't need me to tell you, many people have gone backwards financially, um, particularly women. But AJ Bell did some research a little while ago now, um, and it suggests that the investment uh, gender investment gap is much, much bigger than the gender pay gap. On average, women have less than half the amounts invested as men. As Beyonce put it, um, I was like quoting from Beyonce, money gives uh, men the power to run things. So again, we need, we need equality at home and we need equality of wealth. And AJ Bell, we're now um, undertaking some new research to get a really detailed picture of the pinch points in a woman's life so that working together with you, um, we hope that we can address them. So now after making all that progress before, I think we really are at a crossroads when it comes to gender equality. The three issues determining where we go next, the domestic side, the money side, 
and definitely our own confidence as women to forge ahead in our own way as women. Now, there are opportunities. Um, new ways of working should, of course, in theory, be a boon uh, to anybody who wants a more balanced life. And that's not just women or mothers or those with caring responsibilities, of course. And to be judged on work done, on our outputs, rather than hours spent at a specific desk. That would be re a real win. And yet so many of us seem unsure or conflicted by this. Um, I chair something called the Diversity Project, and we this year launched a very exciting program called the Pathway Program, which is deliberately designed to solve that 12% problem and to create more female fund managers. At our launch event, we heard from four successful women in fund management, and it was just a recurring theme that all of them seemed to feel extra conflicted now by the fact that there wasn't an obvious place where they should be working. I've realized that goes with the territory. Working mothers and carers, we often feel that we're just always in the wrong place at the wrong time. When we're in the office, we should be at home. When we're in the home, we should be in the office. Like every aspect of life, my philosophy is that we have to try to overcome our anxieties and instead just accept it and make it work for us. Um, that includes, includes deciding, and certainly this is how I try to live my life, um, to be absolutely present wherever we are. So instead of always regretting not being in the other place, uh, be really focused on our family when we're at home, be really collaborative with our colleagues when we're in the office. That said, I know it's easier said than done. Um, and I think that the key uh, to work on now is our degree of confidence. To be confident not only in our abilities, but in our decisions and how we as women are perceived. Now, I feel confident these days, even though my career has definitely not go, gone in a straight line. And frankly, the disappointments or problems nowadays have come from a greater height and are more public. Um, but those uh, setbacks don't own me in a way that they would have done 35 years ago. Now, for most of us, myself included, that confidence doesn't happen overnight. It needs to be developed, um, but it can be helped along by others. After that first career setback that I had as a first time mother, I joined, perhaps not surprisingly, I left that firm and joined a smaller, as it turned out, more meritocratic company, uh, Newton Investment Management. Um, and there the founder, Stuart Newton, became my mentor. Now he was way ahead of his time. He had built a business and a whole investment philosophy based on the idea that you need multiple perspectives, different points of views to get closer to the right answer. And that's particularly true when you have a really complex problem to solve. It's not always easy deciding where to invest. Uh, in fact, it's rarely easy. Um, and so the investment process that he constructed really drew out different experiences, different perspectives, different approaches to, to a problem. And he told me absolutely straight to my face, Helena, it's because you went to state school, because you're a young mother, because you studied philosophy at university. These are all the reasons why we hired you and want you to bring those characteristics into the investment process do not just try to be like everyone else. Now imagine how that made me feel, especially after that rather disappointing uh, first career setback. And Stuart's confidence in me helped me in turn to become more confident in myself. I started to dress the way I wanted to, you no know, more pinstripe suits, although now there are fashionable ones. Um, and of course that helped me come across as more confident and people, my colleagues, started to give me more responsibilities. I learned through that that people have confidence in confident people, not surprising really. And gradually, um, and unwittingly to start with, I certainly didn't appreciate this at the time, I realized that I was creating a personal brand that actually sometimes being different enabled you to stand out um, in a good way. I still use some of this. Um, uh, recently, I tabled three amendments in the House of Lords at the, the Public Order Bill, and this is an arena where I'm still very much outside my comfort zone. Um, I use every uh, trick in the book to try to get myself in that confidence space, including wearing, sorry if this is going to make me sound like a sort of much older Elle Woods, if you've seen Legally Blonde, but you know, my favourite pink suit. Um, and it turned out not to be so scary. I had these techniques for preparing. I worked hard on practising what I was going to say. I consulted with family and friends. Um, and it turned out that that was actually quite a bonding moment for me and some of my colleagues in the House of Lords. Um, but again, I had to sort of draw on my own propaganda, as it were, um, to dress and to practice so that I was as confident as a speaker as I could be. So I keep pushing myself outside my comfort zone. Time and again, I have learned it is much better to try 
um, and to recover from setbacks if, you, if those occur, rather than to never try at all. Uh, lots of us as women uh, get so frightened of what might go wrong that we never set foot on that journey to success. Um, and I'm on a mission these days to try to overcome that reticence that a lot of women feel, or help them out overcome that reticence. My mentors were a big part of that, um, and they also helped me to see that careers, um, like a financial journey, are marathons, not sprints. Marathons, of course, demand a lot of energy over a sustained time frame. And the recent news earlier this year that the New Zealand Prime Minister at the time, Jacinta Ahern, was stepping down because she didn't have enough left in the tank, I'm sure really resonated um, with lots of people listening. Um, and particularly, I think, since we've all been worn down quite a lot by the events of the past few years. I now recognise the signs when I am running out of petrol or whatever the expression is um, for your energy. Um, I wake up at 3 a.m., I get itchy eyes, you know, I start to really get very stressed. So now I try to cope with those um, symptoms before they really escalate um, and become debilitating. And I don't think any of us can succeed unless we try to not suddenly become narcissistic and obsessive about time for ourselves, but we certainly need to look after our health, financial health, mental health and physical health. And finally, I know this is probably going to be a mix of men and women listening, then it's really important to succeed as ourselves. Um, there's a lot said about authenticity. I've learned, again, that you might want to be somebody a bit different sometimes, um, but we really do need to um, succeed if we're women as women. Um, I really don't uh, subscribe to all of her policies, so, but so I'm giving her another shout out. But Jacinta Ahern also made a big impact on me for leading like a woman and for saying very clearly that um, she believed you can be both compassionate and strong. I have to say here, here to that. So I just wanted to end on the note that um, if we are going to, at this crossroads now, go forward and make further progress for not just women's sake, but the whole of society, then um, we need to adopt a bit of that. We need to succeed as women if we're women uh, to help each other along the way. Um, and in so doing, I think we really will make it a good time to be a girl, a wonderful time to be a woman, and help create a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Next up, we're very pleased to introduce our first guest speaker, and she's going to be tackling an absolutely crucial subject, that of climate investing and decarbonisation. This last year has been fascinating because we've all seen big oil companies rolling back on their commitments, but we've also seen the consumer really taking a look at the ways they can use less energy. Yes, to save money, but the byproduct has been some fascinating discussions on cutting back and long term energy security. Talking us through the difference that investors can make in helping us reach the goals of the Paris Agreement, Emily Goodall, Head of Stewardship Europe. Of Fidelity International. Hi everybody, my name is Emily Goodall and I'm the Head of Stewardship for Europe at Fidelity International. Um, I'm here to talk to you about climate investing and specifically the role that investors can play in decarbonising the environment. Usual disclaimer, um, there are some elements uh, in the presentation that uh, this disclaimer will apply to you. So just holding this up here for everybody to see before we start the presentation. So there are a few areas that we're going to cover in the session today. Um, this is around the learning objectives as this is a CPD session. Um, and those particular areas are around uh, how the climate crisis is demanding really urgent action. And the investment community has a key role to play in decarbonisation. We're going to look at how we consider our approach to climate change as Fidelity International, a global asset manager, and the two key pledges we have made and why. And the main point, I think, to take away from that will be that engagement as a form of action on the part of investors to influence company behaviour, we feel is highly necessary to actually enable decarbonisation in the real world. Um, and also to recognise some other ways in which investors can contribute to reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement. So what is net zero? Uh, net zero is all about achieving a balance in greenhouse gas emissions, summarised as GHG here and throughout the presentation, that are put into the atmosphere and balancing against those that we can take out through 
uh, sequestration and carbon capture storage and other technologies that some of which are available today, some of which um, are in development. And you can see here from the graph that on the current trajectory carrying on as business as usual with the current emissions forecast uh, would take us, um, well, take us above the necessary thresholds, which we'll come on to talk more about. Now, the bulk of these are anticipated to be mitigated and reduced through conventional mitigation techniques. So um, technologies and developments that already exist, uh, but need to be scaled rapidly. And then there's a smaller section here at the bottom of the graph, which indicates the carbon removal technologies um, that, are, that are required in order to really bring that zero goal within reality. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, sorry, IPCC, estimates that to maintain average global temperatures um, at 1.5 degree above pre-industrial levels, which is the Paris Agreement um, that has been set by multiple company, um, multiple governments, sorry, uh, net global emissions have to fall to zero, as was discovered on the previous slide, by 2050. The associated impacts to investment portfolios, so why should investors care, falls really into two main categories, which I'll explain with more in the next slide, but these basically relate to physical risk. So physical risk from changes in climate patterns that links to droughts, floods, hurricanes, other extreme weather patterns that we're starting to see, um, and that can definitely directly affect investment performance. Our transition risk is about high to low carbon intensity, um, and the, the, ch the, the, the challenges of a rapid transition in the regulatory environment, for example, that then plays out into how companies misrespond, that it happens very rapidly in a sort of disorderly transition, which is one of the three scenarios here, um, could be quite costly also to investors. So we're looking at either an orderly transition, which requires early action and increasingly stringent climate policies that would result in low physical and transition risks, or we're looking at disorderly transition, where later action from regulators and coherent policy action may, and limited solutions or the uptake of those solutions, would actually mean a sharper emissions reduction is required if we're still to hit the target required. And that would anticipate uh, actually a higher transition risk and low physical risk. While the hothouse world scenario is the do nothing um, and continue on the current trajectory, which is global warming by a considerable amount, um, completely uh, unforeseen territory at that point, three degrees plus by 2050, which would be low transition risk because nothing has happened in terms of the rapid regu regulatory change, but would result in high physical risk. Now we're probably most in the second scenario here in a disorderly transition, um, so, but, but with elements of, of physical risk. Um, and to just articulate that a bit more, to remind ourselves what do we mean by a physical risk and transition risk. The physical risk is these extreme events um, which have an impact on multiple dimensions in an ecosystem. So this is why we've got food systems as an example. Um, they can be episodic, so sort of one-off uh, significant events that can have considerable uh, consequences, but they can also be chronic ongoing risks. So this is the concept of rising sea levels, so gradual but uh, hugely impactful globally. Um, fresh water scarcity, supply chain disruptions that we have seen in um, 2023, I'm speaking Q2, we have seen recently in relation to food system disruption in Western Europe, for example. Um, transition risk, as I mentioned before on the right hand side here, is more about the legal market risk and technology risks um, that occur as that transition occurs to a low carbon economy. And that could come from regulatory action, as I mentioned, but it could also come from rapid technology shifts, um, reputational impacts, stranded assets, so the concept that there would be assets that currently are valued uh, overly highly if they cannot be accessed. So um, fossil fuel reserves, for example, only a proportion of those can actually be extracted and, and used if we're to remain within sight of the Paris Agreement. Um, which might suggest that some proportion of those assets may be overvalued um, if regulatory change means that actually they can never be extracted and, and, and burned, for example. So, um, and we're seeing there in the graphs in terms of an example of coal sector performance, how that might be playing out in terms of transition risk um, with the MSCI World Index showing the uh, increases over the last few years and the orange line, whereas you see sort of coal indices uh, haven't, had the, haven't had the same performance. So climate change is here already. Um, talked about the physical risk that may ensue for uh, individuals, society, investment portfolios. We're already seeing that 
and in fact the slide here there's a lot of examples globally of impacts of the kind of physical risks that were mentioned um, that go back 20 years um, and these are increasing and so we are seeing both the impacts in terms of on as i say individuals and society which can be catastrophic deathly uh, we're also seeing the impacts of that financially uh, and, can, and can price that in already um, and these in the current trajectory are likely to increase in severity and in number um, and that is the challenge that we are all facing so if we look at climate related developments on the transition side so regulatory response on the right hand side here whilst on the left hand side you see market alignment and standards which um, for example, in the case of the Task Force on Carbon Rela Climate Related Sorry, Financial Disclosure, or TCFD, that started as a voluntary initiative in terms of corporate disclosure um, and has now become mandatory in the UK, for example. So you're seeing a rapid um, movement from voluntary standard at times to those standards becoming required, mandatory, regulated. Um, and basically what this slide shows, I won't go through all of the examples, is just the number. This is just a snapshot of um, market standards that are in development and also the global breadth of that on the right hand side. So it's a huge amount happening through the EU in terms of regulatory requirements for the private sector. Um, but also in the UK, in China, in the US, you are seeing uh, regulatory responses, which is heightening the transition risk um, that was that, that was mentioned earlier. Now here, the requirement to solve climate change, we can see that decarbonisation of the economy requires, as was mentioned earlier, both existing, um, there's techniques that we already know of in terms of technological developments and new technologies, new innovations, um, a significant proportion, two thirds of that, of that change and that decarbonisation um, can come through uh, technology that's in maturity or early adoption and the remainder yes still to be discovered still to be um, decided still to be scaled uh, in terms of the climate solutions required to keep us uh, within a hope of the, the Paris Agreement target. So Fidelity has done some research into this identified as you see on the left hand side um, we actually believe that the, solu the solutions are out there is the good news that can enable over 80% of global decarbonisation and these technologies exist today and you can see in the graph on the left hand side there the areas the sectors in which we see that happening so significant opportunities um, in, in power generation industry but across multiple sectors these technologies exist now the challenge as we see on the right hand side is the historic rate of adoption of new technologies has been too slow or will be too slow if we continue that current rate um, to enable that to happen in time within the next 30 years so as an example and um, there are many examples on the right hand side here but let's just look at automobiles the full adoption of automobiles took 90 years um, the full adoption of electric power took 47 years now the good news is that you can see with the line the squiggly lines here um, that rate of adoption has increased significantly over time still not at the levels of adoption rates that we would need um, if we look then at the um, uh, sort of power generation power regeneration for example through renewable sources needs to accelerate even faster so in terms of what an asset manager can do there is an example of fidelity international's own pledges um, parallel paths to net zero emissions. The first and most significant for us is in the net zero investment portfolio emissions by 2050. So this is setting out our own trajectory across our holdings um, and that's accompanied by an operational target, so net zero operational CO2 emissions by 2030. Um, and in this we're part of a global initiative, the IOGCT Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, which has a number, as you can see here, of asset managers involved, um, committed to investing in a similar way and aligning those portfolios with the uh, net zero greenhouse gases by 2050. And how are we going to do this? So in the portfolio we're doing this through our, three, our two key tools. On the left hand side there it's our integrated research so the fundamental research capabilities that fidelity international has use the global research platform to drive that esg integration so you have an integration of the financial and the esg analysis 
supported by a climate rating tool, it's a proprietary tool that we've developed that's applied across our holdings that support an understanding and assessment of where companies are in that trajectory and I'll come on to explain a little bit more about how that works. While on the right hand side we have our engagement approach, so the concept of acting as a sorry as an active owner um, to drive outcomes at the company level so the first on the left hand side is the analysis and the understanding and on the right hand side would be how we're going to then drive outcomes and improve issue management uh, of decarbonisation by actively engaging with the company leadership um, for the companies that we hold so we have our net zero ambition we have the proprietary climate ratings in addition, we have made a commitment to apply uh, a, a phase out um, to thermal coal exposure, and we have staggered that. So in OECD or developed markets, the aim is to phase that out by 2030, and in non-OECD or emerging markets by 2040, recognising the global inequity that there's been in terms of the predominance of emissions are coming from developed markets and have for some time. Um, so allowing that, that phase out to enable the scale up of the appropriate energy sources in emerging markets that's required at a rap more rapid rate. And then the final element on the right there is our stewardship um, approach where we will, in addition to the company engagement I mentioned earlier, will also be deploying our voting capabilities to vote against where necessary the re-election, for example, of directors that do not or are not meeting or are not on a trajectory to meet the minimum climate requirements that we've set out. So those, what are those requirements? Um, our climate rating, uh, the proprietary climate rating I mentioned, is a tool to enable us to assess in a comprehensive and systematic way the net zero ambitions, the climate governance, and the actual capital allocation plans of the companies that we hold. So under net zero ambitions, we'd be looking at current emissions, we'd be looking at forward looking targets, we'd be looking at the credibility of those targets and aligning that with sector specific criteria, increasingly understood what companies in different sectors, whether that's um, automotives, oil and gas, uh, etc., actually what the re reasonable trajectories are or need to be. Um, under climate um, governance, we'd be make, looking to ensure that there is the highest level of oversight for these targets that there are board and executive responsibilities, um, that it's aligned uh, with executive remuneration, and that there's suitable accounting and audit facilities that are supporting that or, or reflecting that. And also that the board is have sufficient oversight of climate lobbying and that there aren't obstructive climate lobbying practices underway, um, which can undermine, of course, those targets. And then finally, capital allocation would look at the transitions that are required within particular sector specific business models and also the level of allocation of um, resources to climate solutions so not just on the mitigation front but also solving um, and applying to um, climate, climate solutions and then across each of these this would result in a score you've got five levels um, the top two achieving or enabling net zero or aligning to a net zero path would enable those companies to be uh, eligible for a net zero portfolio holding. Um, the high transition potential, low transition potential assessment would lead to um, further engagement, potentially even escalation to voting to try and drive up present and um, drive up the uh, adherence to the ratings where possible. And actually, if we are seeing no evidence of transition potential to net zero, then that would be the case over time to look at potentially exiting the company. So there are clear um, there are clear onward steps from the assessment that we uh, make of that company. In that, we are harnessing fundamental research capabilities that I mentioned earlier, so we can integrate this into the research process. Um, one of the benefits of Fidelity's um, long-standing relationship with many of these companies is it gives us the opportunity to engage with those senior leaders and their decision makers. So that gives us uh, um, the opportunity and an added edge in that engagement approach. Um, and we expect that to lead to, as I say, improved financial and non-financial outcomes in relation to climate. And that process on the right hand side is it's a, it's a relationship based uh, process uh, where we'll be engaging with those companies over time to track and monitor any changes. So how do climate risks impact our voting policy? Um, well, we have a public policy on climate change and on the voting approach, so you can find that on our website, so look into more detail. 
um, we would look at the company assessments um, through all the criteria that I've just mentioned on the previous slide. And then that will influence where we don't feel that there is sufficient progress being made uh, voting. So potential to vote against directors at the AGM um, for those high emission companies that are not meeting minimum criteria. So we take a targeted approach looking at the 70% emissions by sector. And that includes, um, this refers to here, CA100 Plus is the Climate Action 100 Plus, which is a global collaborative initiative involving a number of other investors. Um, where, that are working together to target specific high emitting companies. Um, and in that, the idea is to really focus efforts on the industries that are both most affected by climate change and, the, and where there is this real degree of urgency um, in progress being seen. And then that was uh, published in 2021, our climate policy and the voting policy and the implementation began last year in 2022 and we targeted nearly uh, 800 companies um, in the process uh, of engagement and then voting in 2022. So these uh, reports are all available um, for further information if, if people are interested to look into this further. Both our policies, um, which I mentioned in the bottom right here, and our TCFD or Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure Report in the top right, um, there's a number of external reports for, per fund available um, to give a sense of the sustainability characteristics and climate performance. Um, and then there's also a significant dashboard we have for our own internal reporting and, and management and oversight purposes. So in summary, to finish up, um, what can investors do about climate change? It's very clear climate change is happening, has been happening for some time, and that this is escalating, um, and that rapid, rapid action is required to stave off what is actually an existential threat, um, both to humanity, uh, to the planet, so the planet will recover to some extent, but there may be far reaching consequences, certainly for humanity and other species. Um, I think the challenge here is that there is limited evidence that cleaning portfolios absent engagement with companies can lead to a carbon reduction in the real world. So it is, you know, there is poss it's possible to clean your portfolio in a sense by reducing exposure to high emitting sectors. But the question is whether that actually changes anything in terms of company behavior or those emissions in the real world. And that is our focus. Um, so we believe that engagement is the priority action, um, robust engagement coupled with escalation mechanisms, of course, um, if we are to achieve carbon reduction. And in order to do that, then investors have to be active in seeking to signal their intent and act on um, changes or lack of changes to behaviour amongst companies if we are to affect any change. So that's the philosophy and the conviction, certainly, of Fidelity International. And hopefully in this session, um, this will then enable the, a bit of an insight into um, the implications of climate change for investors, our particular as Fidelity International two-pronged approach, um, and the pledges that we've made to try and contribute. We cannot solve this, of course. Um, this is a many stakeholder uh, required um, action, uh, but we do we are able to contribute and to influence to some extent. And to do that, we believe that active engagement is, is necessary. Um, so that we believe there are ways in which investors can contribute on that basis. Um, and thank you very much for your time today and happy to take any questions um, via the AJ Bell um, if anyone wants to follow up further. Thank you very much.
Now it is time for the wonderful Cathy Brennan, the founder of Financial Coach Resourceful Planner. In Cathy's session, she's going to tackle a real perennial imposter syndrome. I'm sure it's something we've all suffered with at some point in our careers. So what can we do about a lack of self-confidence to take advantage of the opportunities you know we deserve? Please welcome Cathy Brennan. <laughs> I'm lucky to be here today as I received the last rites at birth. I was born in Belfast in 1975, but luck alone didn't get me to this point. So then why do we attribute our success to luck? Do you find yourself shaking off compliments, discounting your abilities and achievements? We spend so much of our time attending to tasks, issues, overthinking, ruminating and often struggle to disconnect from our thoughts and worries. Do you know that when we actively listen, it's with all five senses? So what can you see? Hear, smell, taste and feel. For the next 20 minutes, I invite you to be present. Focus on you on what is happening in your life and be curious to your thoughts and feelings. I came across set point theory, which looks at our happiness and 50% of our happiness is attributed to our, our DNA, our family. That's who we can blame for half. 10% is our circumstances. So as financial planners, we spend the majority of our time discussing with individual clients, their income, their wealth, their assets, their aspirations, if they have children, what they want to do in the future. But the other 40% of our happiness is attributed to our thoughts and beliefs. So that's within our control and we can change that. So our thoughts, uh, lead to how we feel. Do you doubt your abilities, skills or and accomplishments? Do you measure your self-worth through external success? Or do you take on more, try harder to be better? So all of these thoughts and the catastrophizing and the yes, but no, but that can all sometimes be our own self-talk. And there are five types of imposters and what they are fearful of. Well, you've got the perfectionist, their fear is of losing control. The super person has a fear of free time. I was once that person. The genius has a fear of failing and the soloist they would feel shameful asking for help. Then you've got that, the expert in the room. Would they fear anyone thinking that they're inadequate? And then you've got two more. We've got the noticer. Their fear is of not belonging. And the discounter, who I mentioned at the start, the oh, discounting their achievements. Is that a fear? of not being enough. And fear is at the root cause of self-limiting beliefs. It is no surprise imposter syndrome is common in workplaces characterized by close-minded, biased and cutthroat environments. Is financial services the perfect fear-based environment? Let me ask. Do you understand when you're experiencing a negative emotion? Can you name what you're feeling? I came across the wheel of emotion at a resilience workshop. And not at that moment, but subsequently afterwards, I learned that fear was holding me back. That my thoughts weren't facts and that I actually had choices. So let me ask again. Are your personal and professional experiences, are they empowering you to make positive choices 
or are they holding you back? Do you make fear-based limiting choices? You'll notice on the wheel of emotion that bad, fearful, angry, disgusted, and sad. Even surprise can have some negative kind of emotions attached to it. And happy, the yellow segment. It takes five happy thoughts to balance out the one negative for a content life. And when that ratio goes down to three happy moments to one negative, that's probably at the, the right point. This quote really resonated with me. It takes courage to grow up and become who you really are by E. e. Cummings. Have you heard of the saying from the mouths of babes? It's when a child says something very wise or clever. And my light bulb moment came when I asked my three children, what was it like when I was working from home? And my daughter made up this song. Mummy was always on the phone. She never took time, she was all alone. She never ate, not once in the day. And at night she was always away. When Granny died, she was really sad. She did not take time to heal, which was really bad. We're going to get our mummy fixed. We're going to get our mummy fixed. We're going to make a song up on the way and it's going to happen today. You see, our backstory sheds a light on what's behind our, our success and our tendencies to overcompensate. And from a young age, I was aware of money, debt, and death. And this formed my beliefs around money. And it was my internal unconscious narrative. From that story, you can hear that I'd become depleted. I would pushed my family away. And I needed to connect to my values and core purpose in order to grow and transform. And I read this article that Valerie Tiberis contributed to. And I felt that it explains our goals and values. So life is a garden. Our goals are plants and our values are the plants we care about most. What I cared about most was my family. My family were my why. My twin daughters were conceived after two rounds of IVF, and then we had a natural conception to have three children under the age of three. But my internal narrative was that I was working and contributing and being responsible for their financial future. But I was unhappy and I had worked um, myself really to burnout. And it's looking at how did I recover from that? And it was prioritizing my well being, my happiness, and my family. And reevaluating what I cared most about. And through counseling, volunteering, networking, and support of family and friends, I walked the talk. And this is truly what I believe after having experienced that low and the burnout. The financial decisions are the cornerstone to making any change in life. And financial coaching provides clarity, uncovers possibilities, and empowers you to make decisions. You see, after 25 years of advising and implementing financial plans for others, I uncovered my money story. 
faced my fears, took action to make my dreams and aspirations a reality. And I professionally retrained as a financial coach and founded Resourceful Planner, a financial coaching and money mentor service. I also returned to university and um, have a passion for lifelong learning. So in terms of my circle of control and my influence, it took me to realize that I had choices and that I control my time. And when it's gone, I can't get it back. When I was saying yes to work, I was saying no to my family or free time. And there were those people pleasing tendencies to always say yes, say yes to work, say yes to the next thing. And what did I fear? Probably the free time, you know, lost opportunities. But you didn't end up here where you are today by chance. It took time, effort, and you put in all of the hard work to get to this point. Your value can't be measured or quantified. And this is so important. Always remember your value is beyond measure. Your voice is important and has more meaning than you could possibly imagine. You have a song in you that no one else could sing. So own your uniqueness. Stay in your own lane. Don't be comparing yourself to others. So goodbye comparisonitis and imposter syndrome. Thank you. Now it's time for our penultimate speaker, AJ Bell's senior technical consultant, Lisa Webster. Lisa's going to tackle the incredibly tricky area of financial family planning, talking you through how to help your clients make the best use out of family allowances and avoid those pesky tax pitfalls. From tax-free childcare, the higher income child benefit charge, to other tips to maximise family allowances. Ladies and gentlemen, Lisa Webster. So hello and welcome to this session on family financial planning. Um, on the agenda then today, what I'm going to look at is childcare and pensions. Uh, then I'll do a bit on child benefit and whether to claim that or not. Um, a bit on planning between spouses and then we'll finish off with tax wrappers for kids. So childcare and pensions to start with. So. They're not particularly things you'd always put together, but uh, as we as we techies say, there's always a pensions angle on most things. Um, but there were two things that were both uh, sort of heavily featured in uh, the spring spring budget this year. Um, and I spent quite a lot of time the last couple of months talking about lifetime allowance changes. So um, it makes quite a nice change not to be talking about that today. Um, if anybody is interested, we have got it. It's still um, a webinar that I did on those changes. Um, on our info centre on the website, but today uh, we're going to be focusing uh, more on the childcare element and the um, childcare changes that came in as part of the budget. Um, so I'm going to start by looking at the, the childcare hours, um, what we've got now and what's changing in the future. So this is all part of the government's plan um, to help working parents get help getting more parents back into work as well um, is, is really the idea behind this. So at the moment, when we're looking at uh, free childcare hours that working parents get, at the moment, there is 30 hours available for three and four year olds. And to qualify for that, um, basically, if, if you're in a family with two working parents, then both parents have to be working. Um, and there is some minimum requirements on it, which is it's minimum earnings, which is equivalent to sort of 16 hours at minimum wage. Uh, so you both have to be earning at least that to qualify for the 30 hours for three and four year olds. If it's a single parent family, then it's just that one parent would have to meet that requirement in, in order to qualify. 
Um, the RV hours are term time only, so it's 38 weeks a year um, that you get them, and depending on your childcare provider. Um, some will make you let you might let you spread it over the year, so it works out as about 22 hours a week if you spread it over a full year. Um, but technically speaking, it's you know it's, it's term time only um, for those hours. So that's where we are now. What's going forward was announced in the budget was this this stepped increase in free childcare hours. So the reason it's a stage process is is simply because you know there isn't the childcare provision out there at the moment. We can't suddenly give these free hours to working parents because there aren't enough childcare spaces to accommodate it. Um, so this is why it's been done in stages. So from April next year, the plan is that all two-year-olds of working parents uh, will get 15 hours free. Uh, September 24th, that's going to go all the way down to nine months old. So the idea on that is that this your free childcare will kick in as soon as paid maternity leave ends. Uh, and then from September 25, that will go down, um, sorry, all the way down to nine months, you'll have the 30 hours free. Um, so that is what is planned, what we've got coming that was announced in the budget. Separate to that is the provision we have for 15 hours for all three and four year olds. So everybody, all parents get 15 hours for three and four year olds at the moment. So that is regardless of whether you're working or not. So the way sort of the idea behind that, the 15 hours bit is really about um, the child and, and the child's education. Um, and the child's development that they get those hours um, sort of preschool 15 hours but anything that's above that like the 30 hours and then the extension of the hours is more about the parents being able to go to work and have childcare um, so that in order that they can do that um, so these are the hours that's been extended that are going to be extended this is what the plan is but you know what is the cost in that you know what is the cost of childcare and the savings what difference how much is this worth um so the um, childcare trust uh, did a survey last year and these are the average figures for cost childcare costs in england so average nursery cost for an under two year old 140 pounds a week part time so they base that on 25 hours 273 pounds a week full time 50 hours so the reason it's 50 hours is you know so you can do a full time job you can drop off your child go and do a full day work and come back and pick them up um so they are obviously slightly longer hours on that um to give you a sort of an indication of you know, what's that worth if you look at it on a yearly basis that's about seven thousand pounds a year the part time Fourteen thousand pounds a year, it would cost you um, full time. So you know, substantial, substantial amount of money. Um, for three and four year olds, the costs go down um, partly because obviously we have the free hours that come into play, but also with your child ratios as well. Um, so it works out as about fifty four pounds a week part time and one hundred and five pound a week full time for a three and four year old. Um, so yeah. Clearly, at the moment, you know, we do have one of the highest childcare costs uh, in the world. It's it's widely reported. Um, you know, it's a lot of money, and for most people who have their children, you know, two or three years apart, you know, it's very common for most people at some point in their lives, if they if they are having children, to have two children uh, who are who are under preschool. You know, so they'll be paying, you know, could be paying for two children at a time, even without twins or anybody having more. Um, you know, that, that's a fairly normal sort of pattern. Um, so obviously it's an expensive business. Um, now with the childcare hours, I say it is targeted at working parents um, and we have got these minimum requirements in terms of earnings to qualify as working parents, but also we have this maximum limit as well. So all those childcare hours with the exception of the 15 hours for three and four year olds, but all the other hours that we have at the moment are lost if you have adjusted net income of above a hundred thousand pounds um now that is the position on the current 30 hours for three and four year olds um now with the announcements in the budget about the expansion of the child care hours for working parents they haven't actually yet re released the details of you know what the requirements are around to qualify for it but it is being built an extension of the existing system that we have for say 30 hours for working parents for three and four year olds so 
we're expecting this criteria to be the same when the programme is expanded, when there was more out free hours, that this will be the same criteria. We think, just to say we haven't had that confirmed, but that's that's the general feeling. Um, so, say if adjusting that income is over £100,000, you lose your entitlement to those extra childcare hours. And it's not a tapered loss, it is a cliff edge. So if you earn a pound over £100,000, um, then you lose all those childcare hours, the same with the exception of those 15 hours for three and four year olds. Uh, in terms of what counts as adjusted net income, so it's your total income, so earned income, but also interest, dividends, trust income, etc. all counts in that. Um, the deductions you can make are things like trading losses, uh, gift aid donations and pension contributions. So it is useful. Um, and I've got a, a case study that I'll, I'll show you in a minute um, about how pension contributions can be used to help keep childcare hours. Uh, but it's not just childcare hours. We also have tax free childcare out there. So, um, so this system uh, is available to parents now. Um, my children are old enough that I used to have the childcare voucher system. Uh, and if people are still on that, you can carry on, but no, nobody knew. You know, new parents can have a childcare voucher through their employers if um, they um, if they haven't got it already. So, so new parents they can have a tax free childcare account with the government. Um, so it's it's separate. It's not via your employer whether your employer offers it or not. You know, it, it's available. Um, and basically, every eight pounds you pay in gets a two pound top up, uh, with a maximum of two thousand pound top up. Uh, a year per child on that. So it's done quarterly, so you can pay in up to £2,000 a quarter, get £500 um, a quarter top up and use that to pay for uh, your childcare. So if your nursery hours aren't covered by your free hours, um, it's actually up until the child is 12 on this. So you can use it for wraparound care afterwards, for breakfast, after school clubs, holiday clubs, things like that. Um, parents, again, must be working and it's the same criteria that it is lost if your adjusted net income is over a hundred thousand pounds a year. Um, now the take up on this has actually been really low. Um, so there was so the figures I've got at the bottom there. So OBR did some projections in 2017 um, of how much they thought this was going to cost the government in these tax-free top-ups for childcare, uh, which is the dark column you can see. And then the actual spend is the lighter column. So the government outlay has been about 75% lower than projected. So people aren't using this as much as they uh, as they could do. So for working parents, you know, as long as they're just in their income is below £100,000, I don't know why you wouldn't be using it. Well, it's just an awareness piece. Um, you know, whether you're a basic or a high rate taxpayer, it doesn't matter. You know, you can pay in and get this top up, which you could then use to spend on your childcare. So if you have got clients with children just make sure you know so if, if they're uh, just in their income for both of them is below 100,000 then just make sure that they're using this and taking advantage of it um so let's look at a, a case study or two of, of sort of the impact of this 100,000 pound threshold then so we've got molly here who has income of 95,000 pounds a year she's returned to work now having had a second child she's got a one-year-old and a three-year-old she uses the tax-free childcare. um September 2025, if we fast forward a couple of years, she gets a pay rise of £10,000. What's the impact of that additional £10,000? So, first of all, an extra £10,000, she's a high rate taxpayer, so she'd pay £4,000 high rate tax on that. Also, we know that once you go over £100,000 earnings in the year, you start losing your personal allowance, and so you lose, so you actually effectively you pay more income tax so the five thousand of that that's over the hundred thousand pound limit um, she'll pay an extra thousand pound income tax on that she would also lose all her tax free child care because she's got over a hundred thousand so two thousand pound per child and she would lose 45 hours of child care so that would be the full 30 hours she would lose for the one-year-old the three-year-old would still have the basic 15 hours entitlement but they would lose their additional 15 hours. Um, so if you worked out the cost on that, which average it for the figures for the childcare survey, uh, it works out around about £9,400 that that would be worth that um, childcare hours. So in this example, 
a 10,000 pay rise has just cost her £18,400. So uh, that's that's pretty vicious. Um, I, you know, we talk about, you know, loss of personal allowance over £100,000, you know, people, um, you know, 60% effective rate of tax. Well, you know, this this one, that pales into comparison compared to what you can lose if you tip over the 100,000 point and you have childcare, uh, especially preschool childcare. Now, having this example set September 2025, but, you know, if somebody did this today, they would still lose that tax free childcare element. That is exactly the same today. Um, what they would lose is would be 15 hours childcare, because if you did it today, it would be the three year old would go from 30 hours down to 15. There wouldn't be anything for the one year old anyway. But, you know, you would still be, you know, well over 100 percent. You'd be looking at sort of, sort of what about um, 30 percent tax or something on, on that. So, yeah, you, you would be you would be well over it. So. You know, it's, 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 you know, there's, there's a lot to be done, you know, it's these tipping points, which are so important. So, um, yeah, what, what she could do instead, when she gets this pay rise of £10,000, the first thing I would do would be have a conversation with her employer and ask, instead of taking the £10,000 a salary, could, could your employer pay it as a pension contribution instead? If they agreed to do that, the impact would be she has £10,000 more in a pension. She has no extra tax to pay. She has no loss of tax free childcare. She has no loss of childcare hours. Much better position to be in. Um, if the employer said no, they weren't willing to pay into the pension, it could only be a salary, then what she could do is she could do a personal contribution instead. So she would you know, take the pay rise, put a personal contribution in £8,000 net, you know, get the relief of source in the, in the uh, pension scheme and then get her extra tax relief outside it for a higher rate but that would still achieve the same goal of getting that extra 10,000 in the pension and keeping all the child care it still works the only reason you go for the employer one first is obviously for the NI savings on it it's slightly more tax efficient but it would still work to do a personal contribution if the employer contribution wasn't an option but yeah it can have a really really big impact uh moving on then to child benefit to claim or not to claim is the question so let's have a look at what you get with child benefit. So this tax year, um, the child benefit went up uh, in April with a uh, line with CPI, so it was quite a big increase. Uh, it was £24 a week for your first child, £15.90 for any additional children you have. There's no limit on that. Um, so for an average two child family, it works out as £2,075 a year that you get. What you also get with child benefit is an NI credits. Now, um, you probably are aware of this, it is quite well known now um, about national insurance credits. So really important, especially if there's non-working parent, usually non-working mum, that she gets her NI credits because um, count towards certain state benefits, but most notably for state pension. As it stands at the moment, if you don't claim child benefit, um, or you don't do it immediately, uh, you know, when the child is born, you then um, you can only go backdate it three months. So, you, you know, if you've missed it, you've lost it. However, government have said uh, in April just gone, but they do le- have plans now to legislate to changes in the future. So if you have got clients that have missed out on this already, you know, and from pre- from previous where they where they didn't claim and they missed out on the NA credits, there are changes planned. We haven't seen what the plans are yet um, to be able to go back and reclaim them. Uh, for, for those that have missed out to go back further for the purposes of NI credits. Um, the NI credits carry on until the child is 12. Let's just say you can get child benefit up until the child is 18 or 20 if they're still in education or training. Uh, but the NI credits is up to the child is, um, is 12. Um, now, yes, there is a plan in place, obviously, to say to so people could go back further, but isn't it better, you know, with people having a child, starting a family, to do it from outset, get your NI credits from outset, then you don't have to, you know, worry about faffing around with it in the future. Um, the other thing which is probably slightly less well known, I would say, is about what you get with child benefit, is that your child automatically gets their national insurance number when they turn 16. You know, because they're known to DWP, they're on the system, it will happen automatically, they will get their NI number issued. If they don't, if you don't claim child benefit, um, then you have to contact, when they turn 16, they'll have to contact DWP and go through an application process to get that NI number. 
uh, and under the current system, um, it can involve them having to go and have a face to face interview with DWP. Um, which, you know, obviously they can do, but I would say it's an awful lot simpler just to fill in a form now, you know, when you, when the child is born, claim, claim credit, uh, claim, claim your child benefit, uh, and then it's something you don't have to worry about in 16 years time or that your child's going to have to go through that process that might have delays and, you know, they might be wanting to work and need it and other things that happen on. It's far simpler just to do it now. So my answer would be to the question, to claim or not to claim child benefit is that you should always claim child benefit always complete the form now as i'm going to come on and talk about um, um we've got high income child benefit charge which obviously is a big reason why a lot of people um, won't have claimed it because <coughs> they earn over sixty thousand pounds they're going to have to pay it back if they claim it but you can just complete the form now and there's a box where you can ask not to be paid it so you, you complete the child benefit form, put the details on there, and it's literally just a tick box saying, please don't actually pay me any money. So if you do that, then you don't have to worry about high income child benefit charge, but you still get the NI credits and the child will still get their NI number at 16. So I think it is um, well worth doing that um, if you have got you know, parents with children that, that maybe haven't bothered uh, because of, of, of the high income child benefit charge that actually it is still worth doing it you know even if both parents are working so you're not worried about the ni credits i think for the uh, ni number point at the bottom it's it's still worth doing it's been a massive decline in people climbing and um, claiming child benefit uh, particularly um, through the pandemic uh, whether that is just sort of awareness and communications and i remember when i had my kids i had a pack from the, the midwife you know the hospital that gave you and told you all about it so i'm not sure whether that's not been happening quite as much but um yeah it is worth doing i think um excuse me um so talking about the high income child benefit charge then um so we had this study um out in march looking at yeah, looking at the, the, the charge. So it's estimated to affect about one in five households that receive child benefit. Um, sort of of that, there's, I think it's about 400,000 people that said in it pay the charge. Um, and the others, so like 700,000, have actually done the form and then ticked the box. So they've opted not to receive it. So there are a lot of people that are doing this already. Um, so they're, they're not affected by it. The compliance checks, that figure there, 125,000 uh, just over, um, the compliance checks they found about half of them were to do with income, inaccurate information. So if you are subject to high income child benefit charge, you have to complete a self-assessment and put it on your self-assessment. So just over half of the compliance checks were because the information was incorrect. And about the other half were where basically uh, people hadn't told HMRC about um, the high income child benefit charge, whether because they didn't realise they were subject to it, um, they hadn't, um, yeah, they didn't realise that they had to complete a self assessment form uh, and report it. And I think that is very common. Um, and, and there's a lot of checks. And basically, when they did their compliance checks, HMRC of those 125,000, in almost every case, um, taxpayers agreed the tax was due. Um, so, yeah, it's just an awareness thing, I think, really, on that. So um, when does it apply? Um, so it applies if either the individual, um, the parent or their partner is in receipt of child benefit and either one of them have income above £50,000. Uh, and if they both do, then it's the, high, the highest earner that pays um, the high income child benefit charge. I think what people don't realise sometimes is sort of in terms of your income, what's included, um, you know, your P60 benefits, you know, you might think oh, your salary is £45,000, but then if you've got a company car or uh, something like that, that could tip you over the 50000 or, you know, other benefits, um, you know, that, that could tip you over. So people might not realise for that reason. Um, it might be that you have... Uh, you know, you've got a client who has, who's got a partner, who's got a child from a previous relationship, um, and, you know, their partner is claiming child benefit, um, but if they move in together, then your client will become liable for the high income child benefit charge if they have income above 60,000, even though it's not their child, if they're living under the same roof, and, um, you know, one of them's claiming child benefit, then the other one who is the high earner, they will be liable to the charge on that. Um, 
and it is normally mum that claims it and dad that pays it so 87 percent of claimants are female 77 percent of the high income charge benefit high income sorry child benefit charge liability is is paid by men uh, so it's a bit of bit of gender wealth redistribution there a little bit eh? um and the way the charge works is every hundred pound earned in excess of fifty thousand, the tax charge increases by one percent. So when you earn over sixty thousand, basically it's hundred percent, and it'll be the percentage of however much child benefit you you claim. That's how much you have to pay back. So once you earn over sixty thousand, you have to pay all of it back. Um, that's that's how it works. So an example here, we've got Smiths, a couple earning 60,000 and 40,000 pounds, two children, so they get child benefit 2,075 pounds. Tax position for the highest earner, on that their income tax on 60,000 would be 11,432 pounds. High income child benefit charge would be 2,075, the full amount. Their tax bill for the year is just over 13,500 on that. If instead the higher earner makes pension contribution, this time I've said a, a personal one, I say um, if they did employ contribution, reduce the income, that would work as well. But yeah, if they made an £8,000 net pension contribution, it'll reduce their income tax bill for the year down to 7486, no high income child benefit charge to pay now. So they paid just over £6,000 less tax and that gets £10,000 into their pension. So it's a net cost term of at a, at a net cost, sorry, of 3979. So it's just, it's over 60% tax relief on your pension contribution. So particularly for people who are just tipping over the 50,000, you know, you can put a bit in and uh, take it out, but people in the 50 to 60,000 pound bracket, uh, it's very tax efficient to make pension contributions in that scenario. So uh, moving on, planning between spouses. This is just a quick, I'm sure, recap for most of you. Um, about making the most of allowances um, because it's more important than ever now we've had our all allowances cut this year so cgt capital gains tax the allowance has gone down now to six thousand it's going to go down again uh, next year uh, down to three thousand so make the most of it particularly this year so if you have a husband and wife or civil partners um, then you can do a transfer between them and the person who acquires it is, is treated as acquired it at the book cost of the person who first acquired it. Um, so, for example, you've got a husband and wife um, and the husband has sitting on a gain, he's got some shares, he's got a gain in there of £10,000 um, and his wife hasn't got anything that he gains to, to and you want to dispose of it. Obviously now with, this, with the CGT um, allowance of 6000 if he disposed of it, he'd be paying CGT on that whereas he could transfer half of it to his wife uh, and then they both dispose of it, it'll be £5,000 each, that's within their allowance for this year, there'll be no capital gains tax to pay. If they didn't actually want to get rid of, sell, the, sell those shares, but they had ISA allowance available, then you could actually still do the transfer between the two of them and then they could both do a better ISA transaction. So sell it and immediately buy it back within the ISA, so you've crystallised that gain, used up their allowance or 5,000 each of their allowance this year, but it's now in an ISA going forward. So any future gains, uh, they don't have to worry about. There's no CGT to pay on it. Um, so it's really, yeah, about making the most of those allowances whilst we have them. And so particularly because they're lower, <laughs> to make sure you use both people's um, ISA allowance as well between partners. You know, you've got a £20,000 ISA allowance each. You can pay into somebody else's um, uh, allowance is treated as a gift. So married or non-married couples could use the ISO allowance. You, you know, you could pay into if you have, uh, you know, partners who are living together but not married, not a civil partnership, you can still pay into the other's ISA um, and it's treated as a gift. Um, it's just the CGT ones where it does have to be spouses or civil partners for that one to work, but you, so you can do for an ISA. Pension contributions as well, obviously you can, have third party contributions going into somebody else's pensions to make up, you know, make use of their allowances too. Um, so for personal contributions, you can only put in up to 100% of earnings, but you have still got the basic amount. So you know, go back to the subject of children, if you've got, you know, a, a, a non-working spouse, you know, you can still pay it up to the £3,600 a year into a pension for them as well, so they can build it up. So yeah, it's, it's just, you know, 
getting as much as you can into tax wrappers, especially now we've had allowances cut, obviously it makes it even more valuable. Okay, final section is I'm going to talk about tax wrappers for kids then. So first one, first one that always comes to mind when you think about children is a junior ISA. So for under 18s, they have to be UK resident when uh, you apply for um, the junior ISA. Um, they can't hold a child trust fund um, and have a junior ISA. Um, the only exception on that one is if you are opening the junior ISA for the purposes of transferring in your child trust fund, in which case you've got, got a 60 day window to do that transfer. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about child trust funds in a minute. Um, you can only have one of each type of junior ISA at a time. So you can have a cash junior ISA and a stocks and shares junior ISA. Um, maybe suggest that stocks and shares maybe are more appropriate especially if you're starting with a child is very young given the investment horizon but you know you can have both that's fine but unlike an adult ISA where you could open a new one with a different provider each year if you wanted to and you can have as many of them as you like as long as you don't pay into more than one of each type in each tax year for a junior ISA you know if you've got a stocks and shares junior ISA with one provider and you want to use a different provider for a stocks and shares junior ISA, you have to transfer your existing one uh, and then you can pay into the pay into your new one. Once it's been transferred, you can't have two separate ones. Uh, you can't take the money out until they're 18. It is only the parent or legal guardian that can make the application. Quite often we get asked about grandparents and the answer is no, it has to be the parent uh, that makes the application and they are known as the registered contact. Uh, once it's all set up, then you can pay £9,000 a year, so it's a pretty generous subscription limit. Um, anyone can subscribe to it, it's treated as a gift, so yes, fine for grandparents to pay in, no issues with that at all. Uh, a child can move away and still pay into junior ISA, um, which is a little bit unusual. Um, yeah, so if you have a family where you know you've got mum and dad and two kids and they all open ISAs whilst they, you know, they're in the UK and then they, you know, all emigrate to move to Australia, for example. Uh, Mum and dad can't pay into their ISAs anymore once they're overseas. However, they can still pay in for their children. Um, it's a bit of a quirk in the rules that yes, you can, you can carry on the junior ISAs on that one. Uh, no parental settlement rules on them. So, um, you know, there's no issues with mum and dad paying in to that. That's absolutely fine for junior ISAs. Um, and there's a little bit of a a bonus if you like for 16 and 17 year olds because once you're 16 you're old enough for an adult cash ISA um, so you get your £20,000 adult uh, subscription limit but you also have a 9000 subscription limit for JISA as well so you could pay in £29,000 uh, in for 16 and 17 year olds if they have that money available. Um, with junior ISAs then um, so once you, you can't take any money out, uh, once they reach their 18th birthday, um, they have a few options available to them. Uh, they could use some of the junior ISA to pay into a lifetime ISA, because once you hit 18, you're eligible for that, and then you get your government bonus. You can only pay in £4,000 a year though, um, but you know you can split previous year's subscriptions and do a transfer to a lifetime ISA, if that's what they were going to do, try and get the housing ladder or whatever. Um, if they do nothing, then it just converts to an adult ISA. Um, so they take control of it themselves, taking over from the parent, the registered contact, um, but you can carry on in, indefinitely just as an adult ISA, normal adult ISA rules apply, that's absolutely fine. Or the third option is they can, you know, take all the money out and go and blow it all if they want. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's no restrictions on access to it once they hit 18. Um, and as a parent, you don't have control of it anymore. Uh, it is they, because they're legally an adult at 18. It is theirs to do with as they wish, which obviously we all hope we bring up responsible children that wouldn't just go and blow it all on their 18th birthday. But uh, it's just one to be aware of that you don't have control of it uh, any anymore on that one. So when you're paying lots into it, parents need to know that. <laughs> um, so uh, child trust funds touched on before. So child trust funds then. Um, these were introduced back in 2002 for children born between 1st of September 02 and 2nd of January 2011 when they were phased out and replaced by junior ISAs. Um, the big thing with child trust funds is they used to get starting vouchers from the government um, as well. 
so money actually paid in for them and in certain circumstances some children got them you know when they were five as well an extra payment subscriptions run in birth years so it's a little bit different to um junior isas but they do that does present some opportunities which i'll come on to and as i mentioned you can't have a ctf and a, and a JISA at the same time but you can transfer it um and we have our first ctfs matured now so they the first ones matured when the child turned 18 in September 2020. So HMRC, you know, since we've had this maturing CTFs, had a, I've had a report into it, an investigation into the child trust funds. And it's interesting some of their findings. So there's more than £9.7 billion pounds sat in CTF accounts, which is uh, quite a substantial amount of money. Since we had um, the first accounts maturing in September 2020, more than half of that money is unclaimed. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of money in them. People don't realise they've got them. So the last stat on there, that 28% of accounts were set up by the government rather than their parents. So people might not know that they have them. If they've never had to do anything actively to, to open them, I mean, some will have opened them and then forgotten about them, you know, 18 years later. Uh, but some of them never actually opened them themselves anyway. So they might not be aware of them. And it certainly looks like that is the case. There's a lot of money sat that people just don't know about. So what I would say is if you have got clients that have children who, you know, were eligible for CTFs, you know, they were born between 2002 and 2011, that, you know, well, have a conversation with the first, have you got a child trust fund? I'm sure some of you, a lot of you will have done this already, you know, and if you have had one, then a lot of cases you will already have transferred it to junior ISAs. But, you know, if you have new clients come in, if you haven't checked, you haven't asked that question, just, just check whether they've got one or not, um, you know, and even they say, oh, they don't know, um, then you can do, there's a lookup service for on the government website through the government gateway, you can look up and try and track down a child trust fund. Uh, basically, you need the parents and I number. Um, and then you can try and track it down. Um, if you just Google, you know, find, find child trust fund, it'll, it'll come up and you'll be able to find it quite easily on that. So, yeah, it's worth doing if you say if you have got clients with children that were born in that time period. And then if you do find them, um, you know, there is this transfer opportunity if you're moving them across to junior ISA because, let's say, the CTF years run in from the child's birthday, not in tax years. So in this example here, we've got a child whose birthday was on the 1st of August. Um, so now if, if you discover this child trust fund now in this tax year, then you can make a subscription for them. Oh, it's good. Of £9,000. So it's the same subscription limit as the junior ISIS, but it is separate. So you could make a payment in now. And then after their birthday, you can make another one because it runs in birth years, not in tax years. You could then do a transfer to the junior ISA. Junior ISA uh, runs in tax years. You then have your junior ISA limit as well that you can use. Uh, so you could put uh, 9,000 pounds in. So you could actually put in three payments in one tax year. So you could get it up to 27,000 pounds. And then after six of April next year, obviously you've then, you've got your JISA allowance again to do it. So you, there's a lot of scope for getting money in, uh, you know, if, if you have got child trust funds and you need to transfer on them. Um, quick one on junior SIP, really. So it is possible to have SIPs for children. Uh, it'll be the parent or legal guardian that normally looks after it until they're 18 and make the investment decisions on there. Um, you can pay third party pension contributions in. So normally it'll be the 3,600 basic amount that could be paid in unless the child has earnings. Um, contribution is a gift. Um, uh, and that converts to a SIP at age 18, as in a full adult SIP for them to control themselves. Now, obviously, the big thing on this is access, because if you're you know, opening a SIP for a child, um, you know, what, how old are they going to be before they can access it? I mean, at the moment, we're on 55. We know it's going up to 57, excuse me. Um, by the time they get there, it could well be into 60s. Uh, it's a long term plan, definitely. Um, what junior SIPs can be useful for is if they are beneficiaries. So usually like grandparents, if they left some of their pension to a, uh, to a grandchild, um, they can have a junior SIP. 
and because you can access it at any age if, if you're a beneficiary um so as long as it was accessed for the child's benefit school fees is the obvious one and um, then that would work and that, that might be a viable option on that uh, last one to look at for children is bear trusts so um children can't own stocks and shares you can't own them until you're 18 uh, but you could have a bear trust to make investments for a child. There's no special tax wrapper for this, so, you know, um, tax advantages, but it's just the fact that a child still has the usual allowances. They still have a personal allowance, dividend allowance, CGT allowance. So you can use them within a bear trust. So the trustees, parents, grandparents, um, you know, would make the investment decisions on that, use their allowances. Uh, the one thing you have to be careful of with bear trust is if the parents pay into it and the income from the trust is more than £100 a year, it is taxed on the parents. So it doesn't really work for parents. What it does work for is grandparents. So if grandparents want to pay into a bear trust uh, so they can use the, the child's tax allowances, um, because it's a bear trust and the child is the beneficiary, you can make withdrawals at any time for the child's benefits. And again, school fees is the obvious one for that. Unlike a junior ISA, the child doesn't automatically get access to it at 18. So uh, take control of it at 18. It, the Bear Trust can carry on indefinitely. There is no time limit on it. So if they turn 18 and they want their grandparents to carry on you know, managing the investments for them and looking after it for them, then that's absolutely fine for that to carry on. Um, However, once they've turned 18, they have got the right to access it. So they can demand access to the funds once they turn 18. Um, and the trustees would have to, you know, go along with that. So would have to, um, but, but in other circumstances, if they're happy to let someone else, the trustees carry on running it for them, then they can do. Right, just to, just to summarize then, um, childcare, uh, make sure you claim what childcare help you can. Um, that's particularly, the, they say the tax-free childcare isn't really um, taken up very well. It's very underused on that. Watch out for cliff edges. The 100,000 one is horrendous. Um, so particularly if you've got clients that are, have preschool children with the childcare hours and the tax-free um, childcare, you know, if you can work their income to stay just below the 100,000, it's well worth doing it at least until the you know, ch children get into school. Um, and then the other one around the um, high income child benefit charge on the 50, 60,000 point as well. Um, and then maximizing all the family's allowances, make sure, you know, the CGT, make sure you spouse or transfers, you know, you've got children have allowances too as well. Just using it all and making the most of it all, particularly saying now our allowances are all cut. Um, but that is all from me. So I do hope that's been useful and thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Lisa. Finally, it is time to welcome back our last speaker. Some of you will have heard her at some of our other events, but whether you know her story or not, you're in for a treat. Cor Hutton developed sepsis in 2013 and doctors had to amputate her hands and legs to save her life. She found she was treated differently because she was disabled and has campaigned to change perceptions. As our charity partner this year, Cor's going to update us on finding your feet and how life has changed for her since her double hand transplant. Please give a huge welcome to Cor Hutton. Hi there, you can obviously see I am Cor Hutton and thanks very much for listening to me. Um, and thank you to AGL for having me here. Um, I, I suppose uh, you, you, you want to know probably the reason why I am here. So strange not speaking to an audience eye to eye. So I hope this is I hope this is okay for you. Um, yeah, I was a busy uh, working mum, getting about, looking after a four year old, trying to get to work, trying to run a business, etc. When I had a bad cough for about two weeks and um, did the usual, I took the lozenges and I took the cough bottles and I tried to get rid of the cough. And at the end of two weeks, I thought enough need to go to the, the doctors and get an antibiotic exactly what I did on a Friday afternoon and hoped that it would be going over the weekend um, but sadly that wasn't the case and in fact the, the very next day found myself in hospital collapsed in a hospital bed 
um, with my body shutting down, all the organs shutting down, um, and my family called to say goodbye. Um, that shocking, that quick, and um, no time for preparations or, uh, or or treatments. It just literally wasn't expected to survive the night. Um, you probably guessed that I did, so I'm going to tell you a bit about that story. Um, what I know had happened was my um, my cough had mixed with streptococcus A, which is in all of us, and the two between them had caused septic shock. And um, the the septic shock is a reaction that is, is an overreaction. In fact, makes your body overreact, and my body was shutting down those organs, um, and clearly just um, trying to die. But I had a very persistent uh, staff at the the accident emergency unit and intensive care, and who uh, tried so hard to make sure that I didn't die that night, um, and in fact came up with a plan overnight to have me flown down by the ambulance to um, the, the Leicester Hospital where they got me on this machine here that you can see in the picture. It's called an ECMO machine and the ECMO machine for me was taking the, the blood from my body, it was chilling it and it was oxygenating it and it was pumping it back around my whole body and doing the work of my heart and my lungs I suppose and giving them a bit of a rest so I could have the strength to try and recover. Um, and it is exactly what happened, although not quite as easily as that might sound. Um, I, I spent uh, 10 days down in Leicester before I came back to Paisley um, home and still on a lot of machines, still on life-saving equipment, couldn't feed myself, couldn't talk, uh, couldn't get out of bed. Um, and so many different machines operating me and my body. So still quite frightening and um, I remember most about that time once I was awake and once I'd heard the story a few times um, and realised how close I'd come to death and I suppose how lucky I was to survive and there's, there's some 60,000 people a year die from sepsis now even with all the raised awareness that has happened um, and sepsis was trying very hard to kill me. Uh, whilst I was in this position with the, the, the machines and trying to improve, um, I had the, the, the medical staff there constantly being so positive with me, so helpful, brilliant with me. And every single day they would say to me, I can't believe you've been able to do that. I can't believe you survived that. I can't believe you've lived through that. I can't believe you're off that machine. I can't believe you've been able to to get to this stage. I can't believe you got through that operation. And, and there's, a, there's a point to telling you that story. I'm not just being big headed, but um, you do start to believe that um, maybe you are a bit different. Maybe you're a bit stronger. Maybe there's something special about you. Maybe <laughs> maybe you are able to work miracles, she laughed. Um, but you certainly take on the positivity and that really helped me push forward and get my health back to a place um, that was manageable to face the next part of my life because um, what was happening whilst my vital organs were being um, uh, looked after by these machines and these medical staff, the extremities of my body were less important obviously and they'd been starved of oxygenated blood. So my feet and my hands had started to go dark pink, <laughs> excuse me, dark pinks and purples and then blue. Uh, I had a podiatrist friend that was looking at me uh, regularly and we could see the changes. We were discussing the changes. We were taking photographs of my hands and my feet and um, and how they were changing. Um, and we knew, we knew that it wasn't good. We knew there was a chance I might lose them, but we were hopeful that they would be able to save a lot. Um, my hands had gone really quite black and crispy and my my feet um here lovely picture for you all to look at um my feet look the same there they look black they look crispy they're starting to lose their flesh but in actual fact they were changing quite a lot so we had quite a lot of hope for saving them and at the end of six weeks of looking after and recovering from my near-death experience it was decided that i should move hospital to another one in glasgow and then the other plastic surgeons would be able to look what was damaged, what was dead, what was alive, what could be saved. And I thought, um, compare notes, scan, treat, and try and work out 
if they could do some miracle and save my hands and my feet. Um, and I arrived in, in the Glasgow Royal one day, uh, late afternoon, spent my first day there. And of course, at this point, I built up a real relationship with the staff at Paisley. And they, as I'd said, had been so kind to me and they knew exactly my story. They'd been through it all with me. Um, suddenly you're in a new hospital, you don't know anybody. They don't know your backstory. They don't know what you've gone through. Uh, all they see is this person here, black hand, black feet. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't know them at all. So that very first morning there, uh, the consultant came in with his squad of people at the end of my bed, early morning, before you've really wakened up. Um, and he stood at the end of my bed with the, maybe the physio and some junior doctors and the ward sister and um, registrar, you know, lots of different people at the end of my bed that I didn't know. But I was starting to get used to the uniforms. So I knew roughly who was standing there, but this consultant addressed the whole team. Rather than me, he was talking to the team and they started to discuss how Miss Hutton was going to lose her hands and her feet later this week. And went on to discuss that for a good 10, 15 minutes or so at the end of my bed, uh, debating and discussing. And this was news to me. I'd never heard this before. Um, this was a whole new thing for me. As I'd said, I thought I was being tested and treated to work out what could be saved, when in actual fact, he was talking about a discussion over a phase, you know, it's sorted, it's decided. And that was quite a big deal. I'm sure you can imagine that um, that kind of news, hearing it for the first time, could be quite cruel. And um, I had no family with me. Nobody knew this was going to happen. Um, and I just waited politely and um, kept the stiff upper lip until they all left my room and and then dissolved into just a, a mess um, of hysterics and um, horror. Um, and just trying to work out what that meant. I have to lose my hands and my feet. What does that mean? What am I? What's my, you know, what does that make me? What am I going to be able to do? Will I be able to be mobile? I've got a four-year-old son. How will I look after him? Um, what will I be able to do? And um, ironically, some of the the, 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 the stories that, um, or the thoughts that come to mind, um, I always, always bring it up and it always makes me laugh to think. I thought, I'll never wear a flip-flop again. Um, you know, it does sound flippant, it does sound not very important, but to this day, 10 years later, it's still one of the most important things to me. I see people wearing flip-flops and I could cry. Um, I could cry because I want to feel my feet cold and I want to feel them on a cold floor or in the cold water. Uh, yeah, I want to feel that. And there's, there's no prosthetic in the world that is going to do that for me. So um, really, it's, it's not something I'll ever... Um, and be able to, to, to get over. But uh, those are the thoughts that go through your head in the beginning. Um, I was no idea if I was going to be able to be a mum to Rory. Uh, no idea what I'd be capable of. And no one could tell me, no matter how good the staff are and were, um, and how kind they were, nobody had been in that position. So they couldn't answer that for me. Uh, they couldn't tell me what I was going to be able to achieve, what I was going to be able to do, how active I could be. Uh, none of these things, and it's just something I had to work out for myself. And at that stage in hospital, I couldn't, I couldn't feed myself, um, I couldn't get out of bed, couldn't wash myself, couldn't do anything, couldn't brush my own teeth. Um, and whilst I'd got my strength up a bit and was feeling a bit better, you know, I was still really weak as well. And I did feel utterly useless, and I did feel utterly worthless. And I'm facing amputations of my legs and my hands. Um, and my family are quite pushy and determined, and that, that decision wasn't going to be let go just like that. We needed to go and get second opinions and third opinions. Um, we did just that. We got the best uh, plastic surgeon in the west of Scotland, got him, got advice from him. Everybody seemed to have the same opinion, though, and that decision seemed to be the only one. So I had to start to face up to the fact that this is what's going to happen. And um, over the next few weeks, I had a series of operations that removed my hands and my feet as predicted. There's a wee picture here for you, which is quite a bit after where you're starting to look a bit healthier and all, but you can see um, I lost my legs at the shins, which was the optimum place. Could have kept parts of my feet, maybe parts of my ankles, 
but I'd never have been able to get prosthetics that would help me walk again. So mid shin was the best place to get prosthetics on. And if you could see me walking now, I think I'd probably be able to surprise you. Um, you know, I, I do walk particularly well. After years of physio and trying very hard, um, we, we manage we manage the legs. Hands were a bit more complicated. I think you can see in the picture there. Um, what they did, what Professor Hart was able to do or decided to do, was just to remove the dead parts of my hand and retain everything that was workable. And he had a plan. So when you remove all the dead black tissue from your hands, you're left with a lot of tissue that's exposed, completely exposed. Um, and you, you, it, it, obviously they need some kind of covering. So what they did for me with my right hand was they sewed it into my hip. So I was at a right angle um, with my elbow sticking out, my hand on my hip and sewn in there for three weeks. And what would happen is that the flesh from my thigh, the ample flesh from my thigh, now actually it wasn't ample then, um, but it would grow over the exposed hand and eventually they would cut a square out and fold it into the mitt that you can see there on, on the picture. Left hand a wee bit more complicated. They took the skin from my forearm, cut it out and twisted it round my hand so that the blood flow was constantly there. So that was really clever as well, but not a pretty look. Um, you know, both hands looked very messy. There was a lot of gangrene scars on that left. Um, quite unsightly and um, yeah it was a tough it was a tough look to get around I could see them every day um, I was affected by them every day other every other people uh, sorry every other person that saw them would take a double take obviously they looked a bit different and I had to face up to the fact that I was different and I was going to stand out and I had to try and work out how that was going to be and I really think, um, I could say I, I had a choice to make, but I suppose I don't think I did have a choice. I think that decision could only go one way. If I wanted to live, then I just had to go on with it. I had only one choice, and that was to suck it up and deal with it and try and move on. And that's what I tried to do. Um, to me, I just I had a son that needed a mum, and he needed looked after as he was growing up and I desperately didn't want him to have a mum that couldn't do things. I really wanted him to have a mum that could show him how to do things and do it with him. So that became really, really important to me. Um, and, and meanwhile, you know, feeling useless and worthless, I, I, I got to know people in physio and I got to meet people in rehab and I got to talking to people about what I'd learned and everything that nobody could tell me I started to help other amputees a bit with it without really realising what I was doing, I suppose. And um, my pushy brothers trying to make sure that I had a purpose in life. I, I couldn't go back to the job I was doing, so they really wanted me to have something to get up in the morning for. And um, suggested that I set up an amputee charity where I could tell people, perhaps before their operation, maybe shortly after, what's available, what's out there, what prosthetics are there, how does the system work, how can you be helped? Um, what help is there, social services, etc. Um, maybe I could help people in the situation that I've been in. And that's when we set up Find Your Feet. And um, we, we set that up purely for that reason. I, I would go to hospital or I would take people out for a coffee. We would have a chat and uh, I would tell them what I'd been through and how I coped. And uh, maybe try and help them skip some parts of the whole research and finding things out. And also, I, I knew I was very lucky in that I had this, this close-knit family and pushy family that would find the solutions for me, that would find the people that could help. And a lot of people don't have that. I was very aware of that. So, you know, maybe we could be that family. Maybe we could help other people find that out. And that's really where Find Your Feet came from. Um, I was yeah, just trying to set up a, a network of peers and we could all help each other. And I've got a little video here that I'm hoping you can see um, with me as I press play.
a quadruple amputee sportswoman and founder of the charity Finding Your Feet. The charity Finding Your Feet has turned your life around. This is with Finding Your Feet, an amazing charity that supports and helps amputees. So you've got your book, Finding Your Feet. Finding Your Feet, charity, Finding Your Feet. Finding Your Feet are doing great work for amputees and the family. Uh, we appreciate all that you do. The world I love, the tears I've dropped to be part of the way you can't stop. Ever wonder if it's all for you? The world I love, the trains I hop to be part of the way you can't stop. Come and tell me when it's time to kickstart the golden generator. Hub. Sweet talk, but don't intimidate her. Can't stop the gods from engineering. Feel no need for any interfering. Your image in the dictionary. This life is more than ordinary. Can I get you, maybe even three of these? Coming from a space to teach you what the pleadies. Can't stop the spirits when they need you. This life is more than just a read through. So, finding your feet is there for all amputees of all ages, uh, male, female, old, young. Uh, anything you like and uh, we do different clubs and classes now throughout Scotland um, and we work with all the other charities throughout the UK as well to make sure that the amputee community is looked after and we know where to go, we know where to get the answers, we help each other. Uh, we have about, uh, yeah, did I say 80 clubs a month? Um, and um, my point for uh, those amputees and the one lesson that I'm always trying, if I can, to, to project is just, just take the opportunities. You can see in this slide here that some of the opportunities that I got, I just said yes to everything. That became really important to me. I had no idea what I was saying yes to half the time. I had no idea if it would be good or bad. Uh, I had no idea if it would pay off or if it was a waste of my time, but there were opportunities. So I am good at that. I will say yes to anything. And that's why I've had so much fun and so many doors have opened for me. Um, and I suppose um, this is where you, you, you realise, uh, from being utterly useless and worthless, you start to realise that these doors were opening for me because of this. You know, maybe I wasn't so useless and worthless. Maybe I was finding a purpose. Um, and maybe that 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 charity, that, that finding your feet and doing these things and pushing yourself out there, would help other people get up and try to do some things as well. And you know, I, I, I'm, I'm known for doing some wacky things. This one here is Kilimanjaro, which I did in 2019, uh, right on the back of the AJ Bell triathlon that I failed miserably at. Um, I didn't fail, I passed it. I did do it. I did do it, but I didn't do it with any grace or uh, um, any style or with any um, great results. But I did finish it, the, the world biggest triathlon. I, I did the little tiny totesy one where it was a small cycle or a small swim and a small run. But in doing it, I found myself in the Thames, terrified, in a panic attack, unable to breathe, um, and just, just totally panicking uh, with anxiety and worried that I wouldn't be able to finish even this short swim. And I suppose after that, although I completed it, I think it made my confidence crash a bit. And I started to realise that I'm, I'm, I'm the best for saying, if you can do it if you put your mind to it. You can do anything you want if you put your mind to it. It won't be easy, but try hard and you'll get there. And I came out of the Thames thinking, you know, maybe you can't. Maybe I can't. Maybe I can't do anything I wanted. Maybe my body has limits and I'm pushing it too hard. So I pulled out this Kilimanjaro trip that everybody was getting set to go on. I listened to their banter and I listened to their um, all the, the, the fun that we have planning it. And you can obviously tell from the photo that I ended up going off and climbing Kilimanjaro. 
And really my point there was I, I wakened up one day thinking, you're not even trying. You've pulled out and you haven't even tried. Surely it would be better if you go and try and fail. That would be much better than not even trying. So yeah, I was able to climb Kilimanjaro and it's a huge success and I, I'm so proud of it. So proud of everyone that did it with me and all the people that helped me do it. Um, I think it, I, it turned out to be the first woman quadruple amputee that had ever done it or something like that. We only found that out on the mountain. Um, but just to be able to do things that people didn't expect of you, people thought you wouldn't be able to do, that was huge to me. And that was where you realise that, you know, you might just be inspiring the odd person or two. Um, and I couldn't have given up because there's all these amputee kids watching me, all these people back home watching me. And what I'm supposed to say, I just gave up. Just wasn't going to happen. So anyway, yes, I climbed Kilimanjaro, but the point I was going to say there is that for some people, some of our amputees are troopers. Getting out of bed in the morning is a big mountain to climb. It's really hard for them to find the willpower and the determination to get up, have a reason to get up in the morning and get out. And hopefully that's where we come in at finding your feet. Um, and what we find is we, we can just give them one glimmer of good in every day, then it might just be enough to carry through them through to the next day until they start to realise that they're enjoying themselves and that they actually have a life that is useful um, and, and worth something that really matters. And really, for me, I discovered that despite losing as much as I lost, I still had a voice and people were starting to listen and I was using it. Um, never be one to, to miss an opportunity like that. I suddenly realised that people were listening. Um, and uh, one of my soapbox moments was this, uh, this sepsis talk where the Scottish Government said, we're not going to raise awareness of sepsis, which seemed like a really silly thing for anybody to say, to be honest, without being political or all. But we went out and we did our 30 second video about the symptoms of sepsis and told people to ask the question, could this be sepsis? Wherever you are, whichever medical person that's with you, your doctor, your nurse, your carer, just ask the question, could this be sepsis? And what it might be enough to do is just see the signs early on and not go through what I went through. And that would be a huge difference. I also got involved with um, uh, the, 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 the uh, Professor Hart I'd mentioned earlier. I didn't get involved with Professor Hart. That was just be unfair, his wife wouldn't like that at all. But uh, when I say I got involved, um, Prof at the time had said to you he removed all the damaged tissue and he left me with what was viable. And at the time he had it in his head and had worked with a team of people who had done the UK's first hand transplant. And at the time that he removed my hands, he was mindful of that. And he had me in mind for potentially being the first double hand transplant in the UK. And he'd asked if I would go and talk to Leeds about this, so the, 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 the experts down, down in Leeds, talk to them about it and see if I'd be interested. And at the time I thought, that, that's not for me. That's not for me. I've been through so much. My immune system let me down badly, I thought. And here in a transplant, you're on immune suppressants for the rest of your life. So you're exposed to everything. Uh, your body's not got that, that defense system that I thought had let me down. So I didn't really want to mess about with it. I didn't really want to be in drugs for the rest of my life. Didn't want to be in a bubble and cotton wool for life. I, I wanted to go on living. But I felt I would prof the journey down to Leeds to talk to them. I did. I went and I spoke to them. And the more I spoke to this team of people, I started to realise how excited they were about me and the potential for me and how good I could be with hands. They saw how determined I was. They, say, they saw how hard I'd pushed myself. And I think because I had no underlying illnesses that we knew of, um, they saw me as a, a good opportunity to get hands working well in a reasonably healthy body now. So cut a long story short, I decided I would consider the hand transplants and they considered me to be a suitable candidate for them. Um, and I got myself onto the organ donation register. Uh, no, sorry, wrong way round. I, I got myself onto the transplant list where they went out looking for a donor for my hand transplants. And this is where I started to learn about the organ donation register, because I'm waiting in hands that somebody has to give me when they die. 
and people all over the country are waiting on hearts and lungs and kidneys and, and, and uh, livers, or they will die. Now, I would never die without hands, I know that. I knew the urgency wasn't there for me, but for other people, could you imagine? Just needing somebody to die to save your life, how, how awful is that? At the time, in Scotland, 30% of the Scottish public were on the organ donation register. And I thought that was pretty poor. I thought 30%, that's 70% that either haven't got around to it, haven't bothered, desperately don't want to maybe, um, don't want to think about it. These are all the excuses I heard. And I started to look at it and I thought we must be able to do something about this. And for some reason, I'm not really very sure why I agreed to it at first, but I agreed to have my body painted, uh, as in the picture here, with all the transplantable organs and use that as advertising for the organ donation register. And we got this visual um, graphic artist, a medical artist, and what he was able to do was paint onto my body all those organs. Um, and it was just an incredible bit of work. Um, he, he was so good, he got all the 3D work going on, so you can see all the, the, the shape, the size projected, the, the 3D image of everything that's going on in your torso and things. It looks like rolls of fat, just for the record, it's not. This is the, the artist being a genius. It's definitely not rolls of fat, definitely, definitely not. Um, and you can see that he also painted my hand onto my thigh to show that you could now get hand transplants. So um, we use this picture um, to try and advertise the organ donation register. And in that, I suddenly felt quite powerful. I felt strong and I felt, felt it was a strong message. And I was very proud of that picture, despite the fact that it's a naked picture of myself. Let's not look too closely. Um, but that picture we used to do what's called guerrilla marketing. Um, we went down to London without any authorization, without asking anyone, and we projected our photo onto iconic buildings around London. And the idea is that you, you've not asked permission, you're going to get moved on eventually, you go somewhere else. But this one here is Waterloo Station, and uh, we stayed there for a couple of hours and nobody moved us on, so it backfired a little. But, but we did get to the Opera House, we did get to the uh, Natural History Museum, and um, that photo was in the front of every single newspaper the following day. And we know that it made a difference to the organ donation register, which at the time still required a sign on. Now, obviously, it's opt out, so everyone's in unless they've opted out. But what's even better is for you to decide, I want to be on that organ donation register or not. What's better is for you to sign it, legal document to say, this is what I want, this is what I would consider donating, and this is what I would do, definitely not donate. Do it yourself, you make the decision, um, put it in writing. And what's really important after that as well is to go off and tell your family because a huge amount of families overrule that decision. So it's really important that you tell them, I've made this decision, don't mess with it. And in my opinion, it should be a bit like your will. This should not be something that your family have to decide when you're dying in the room next door. This should be something that's decided well in advance. And then what the specialist nurse will say to your family is, she'll be back soon. We'll do what we need to do and she'll be back soon. And they don't need to think about the mutilation and cutting you up and stealing things from inside you. It's just a much nicer thought. You'd be sparing your family by doing that. And you could also save a life. And guess what? You might have noticed, because I can't sit still. I did get my hand transplants. Four and a half years later, I had to wait so long to find the right donor. So I, I, I got my hands um, and I was able to fluff my son's hair and pinch his cheeks like I wanted to do. Unfortunately, at that time, he was 11 years old and he really didn't want his hair fluff. And he didn't really want to hold my hand anymore. Um, but they're just fantastic. They're absolutely brilliant hands. Somebody was brave enough to sign the organ donation register. The family was brave enough to allow it to happen. And I got my hands on what a difference that's made to my life. It's huge. It's huge just to be able to touch things, fix things, hold things, tie things, zip things. So many different things now I'm able to do that I really struggled with before and damaged my teeth a lot with because I had to do strange things in strange ways. Uh, and they're just absolutely fantastic. But I also know this girl went on to donate a lot of organs, so there are people literally living today because of her. What a great feeling that must be. I know their family will be broken that they've lost her, 
But just to think that little bit of light, that she's still alive somewhere in the world in different ways and helping people, surely that's a, a nicer feeling than she's gone completely. Surely. Anyway, I think it's about time I came to the end and, and I hope it's been worth listening. But um, some of the messages I, I guess I've learned along the years are just, yeah, I, I, I do look different. I've got scars everywhere. I'm like a patchwork quilt. But what those scars signify, um, the stories they tell, the reminders to me of everything I went through, everything I survived. Why would I want rid of them? They mean so much. They matter so much. So I'm not getting rid of them. I'm proud of them. I'm keeping them. And that voice as well, just the very fact that my, um, my, my life felt so worthless and useless and suddenly people are listening. Not everybody, of course, and it only matters if one person hears the story and it means something to you. Somebody found a wee bit of strength in it, somebody pushed a wee bit harder, they got over a hurdle perhaps because they heard of somebody else's fight. That would be nice. It would be nice to think that the ripples that that cause along the way matter and that your voice matters. The job I'm doing matters so much more than what could have happened as a life ended or or I've hidden under the duvet for the rest of my life. That wasn't something that was going to happen with me. I am, I'm here fighting on and Find Your Feet is fighting on and um, uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're trying to do a good job and, and my life matters. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Cor, and thanks all of you for being with us for this AJ Bell Luminary webinar. We hope you found today's session insightful and useful. Please do fill in the feedback form that will pop up immediately after this webinar finishes. It will help us shape future events, providing the content that you want. We promise it'll just take two minutes of your time. It also means we can send you your CPD certificate and a copy of the slides, plus a link to the recording. Now, if you think of any further questions for our speakers, you can pop those on the feedback forms too, and we will ensure that they are passed on for a reply. If you have any colleagues that you think might be interested, please do feel free to share a copy of the recording, and we'd love to see you in person for our Luminary 2024 events. We'll email dates and details out as soon as we have them. For now, from everyone here at AJ Bell, Thank you for your continued support and we hope to see you next year, if not before. Take that.